Hello, we are starting our workshop, BioNet Visa workshop. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, we would like to ask everyone to switch off the video and the um, microphone, except of the speaker. Suji from SDI Tokyo is going to present. All um, uh, attendees are asked to type uh, the questions exclusively in live questions and answers. And, so, uh, and from there, we will read your questions uh, to the speaker. Please, Suji. Hello, am I, uh, am I audible? Yeah, okay. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Suchi from uh, the Systems Biology Institute uh, in Tokyo. And uh, um, today, uh, the topic of my talk is essentially about uh, uh, our text mining uh, work and more specifically on uh, uh, the application of uh, some of our text mining work uh for the covid literature and our attempt to kind of um, use uh, the technologies and platforms we've developed over the last uh, many years uh, to kind of bring context uh, into the large corpus of text that has been uh, communicated in scientific publications and clinical trials uh, in the context of covid uh, so today the the scope of my talk will be in two parts uh, one is to introduce uh, 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 the, the Tuxila platform, which is a, a tool or a window through which a lot of uh, 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 what we present uh, is, is being shown. And uh, also the second part of the talk is uh, 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 to kind of motivate the under, under the hood mechanism of a lot of the NLP research that is powering the platform. Uh, so a little bit of an introduction essentially uh, is uh, so we are uh, headed by uh, Dr. Hiroki Kitano, and uh, uh, he's very well known in the community uh, for his uh, work on uh, SBML and cell designer. And uh, one of the vision that has been driving us uh, recently is uh, uh, on the creation of an engine for scientific discovery. And the idea is uh, with the uh, rapid advancements in AI, uh, ML, and uh, in the amount of data that has been collected. Uh, can we uh, get to a system that eventually can generate hypotheses on its own, conduct experiments on its own, and uh, eventually be able to um, uh, make significant contributions in science. And uh, over the last many years, we've been working on uh, platforms uh, and frameworks that enable us towards getting to this uh, kind of a very uh, 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 a goal. Uh, and uh, uh, I think many in the community know the Garuda platform uh, uh, well. And uh, so an important part of uh, the, the creation of engine of scientific discovery is the dimension of text. And uh, this is a diagram that I have taken from uh, the paper that uh, Professor Hiroaki Kitano published uh, in the AI magazine, where he motivates um, the need for creating such a, a, a system which can uh, essentially kind of generates its own hypotheses and conduct experiments on its own. And if you see an important component of this is trying to understand the knowledge that is there in papers and literature. Uh, and towards putting them together uh, in, in coherent knowledge and then enabling new hypotheses to, to be generated. And uh, the focus of our research team at uh, SBI is a lot on trying to make um, uh, wins towards this uh, 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 towards this goal of trying to see what would it take to generate hypotheses and focusing on the dimension of text. And uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the kind of research directions that the NLP team here at SBI uh, uh, is focused on, so our work is uh, focused on trying to generate uh, pathway networks from text. Uh, or what we call as unstructured data to structured representation. Uh, we've also uh, focused on, a lot on uh, trying to derive insights directly from unstructured text. Uh, similarly, uh, we're working on large knowledge graphs and trying to generate new hypotheses. Uh, and if time permits today, I, I would like to talk uh, uh, some of our recent work on uh, the hypothesis generation problem, uh, which was recently published in one of the premier journals uh, uh, in uh, data science. Uh, but uh, before that, I'd like to uh, kind of take this opportunity to uh, uh, kind of introduce um, a Tuxila, 
uh, for COVID. And uh, uh, Tuxila is essentially what we call as um, uh, the center of learning. So the, the genesis of the name is uh, from uh, the, 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 the Indian uh, uh, subcontinent where this was one of the first uh, centers of uh, learning or one of the earliest universities. And the idea uh, of uh, Tuxila is uh, a contextual aggregation of uh, uh, knowledge uh, in scientific uh, communications, in a, a social discourse, uh, in clinical trials, all the abundant knowledge that is out there, uh, but focused on uh, the specific lens we are interested in. And uh, uh, the system has an engine which uh, every day tries to look out for the articles being published and gets it into the platform. And then once this uh, content comes in, uh, we have our suite of NLP and text mining analysis tools which work on this. Uh, 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 on this data, if you will, and then uh, uh, take us towards the, the, the goal of deriving insights from this data. And of course, uh, Taxila also has um, a contextual search feature, which allows you to kind of search in context to what you're looking for. And uh, uh, the primary uh, USP of Taxila is it's a living system. So every day our, our, our systems go and uh, go out there and get all the data as they are published and bring it into the system. And uh, uh, a little bit on uh, COVID Taxila. Uh, so uh, it's free for access um, and it has over uh, uh, 60,000 articles being uh, currently uh, curated and it's increasing every day as more and more literature is getting published uh, and uh, we primarily collect information uh, in uh, uh, scientific publications, archives, uh, clinical trials and uh, open research data sets such as the COD-19 uh, data set and uh, 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 Taxila every single day tries to get this information into the system and it has a nice user interface through which you can either consume this information uh, as a reader or you can go one step further and, and uh, try to get more involved insights, which I'll go into in a little uh, bit. Uh, and it also serves as a curation workbench. Uh, so it allows you to kind of tag your own uh, articles. Uh, there are powerful visualizations that we have built into the system, uh, which help to explore trends and analysis results. And uh, it also has a reporting feature that allows us to kind of use this data for some downstream analysis uh, if we need. Uh, so uh, coming to a little bit of the feature set of, of Taxila. So uh, as I said, once, uh, once you register for a user ID and password, uh, uh, you uh, can log into Taxila with the user ID password. And as soon as you get in, uh, you will see the front page, which actually shows the, the total number of articles, let's say that was uh, curated in the last, uh, 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 let's say five months or six months. So you can choose the time window in which uh, the, the articles have come in. Uh, you can uh, explore. Uh, so this is essentially the trend of how the articles have come in. The data is organized under uh, what we call as channels or uh, major subject topics. And uh, the, uh, so this is essentially a, a, a touch point to kind of just read these articles. But going one step further, uh, if we want to kind of see the, all these articles in context. So we have, a, we have our NLP system, which uh, reads through all of these articles, uh, tries to understand which are the articles that are talking about a similar uh, 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 context, uh, if you will. And this is another feature where all of the 27,000 articles is presented as a galaxy. And each dot here pertains to a galaxy. And uh, the clustering essentially shows uh, what is the information content of these articles. So uh, each of these article uh, clusters would entail a similar information. So if you, if you have an article that you're interested in, uh, the articles around it are talking about very similar uh, 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 kind of study or are talking about a very similar time, type of therapy. And it's uh, also color coded with respect to the kind of information from which these articles are coming in. So the blue articles are archives, for instance, uh, uh, publications that are coming into PubMed, uh, clinical trials and so on and so forth. And this is fully dynamic. Uh, so you can click on any dot, open the article, read the article, 
uh, and uh, so let me go to the next slide uh, which actually goes a little bit deeper into what happened so let's say i clicked an article of interest uh, as soon as you open that uh, our system has essentially gone through the whole article and identified the key concepts within the article so here it's saying it's talking about a disease area it's talking about some countries it's talking about certain chemicals in this uh, particular uh, article and uh, it's it's also put them in as tags and uh, taxila also allows for users uh, to use taxila as a curation workbench so you could either add tags delete tags and the system would essentially learn from this and the next time it is uh, uh, tagging this information automatically uh, it would kind of learn uh, and become better and uh, when uh, for instance this is an article that you are interested in we also show all the similar articles Sorry, uh, for three yeah. minutes please three minutes uh, yeah sure uh, and uh, so this is and similarly uh, we also kind of can ask very focused questions of uh, hey what are the latest trends of clinical trials in covid so then you can select the clinical trial channel uh, you can get the information as it is but we also do geo tagging so we we also kind of give a visualization where you say hey what are the clinical trials that are happening in china you click on it you get the information of all the clinical trials that are happening in china for instance and and, and this also gives you an overall picture of where uh, all the trials are happening which are the hot spots you can further refine your search in terms of hey within china what is the kind of focus areas and all of that is 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 possible within taxila and similarly taxila has as i said taxila the data that comes in into taxila uh, can uh, be used uh, it, for processing using the different analysis algorithms so you can generate for instance what word, word clouds which give you an overview of uh, the 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 information content of group of articles you can uh, talk about uh, you can also understand okay which are the primary chemicals that are being talked about in all clinical trials which are the most frequent biomolecules that are being talked about in these studies what are the other disease areas that are being uh, talked about what is the keyword trends so you could essentially ask for certain keywords and understand the trend over time uh similarly we also have a feature where we are also trying to understand that there is a large scientific community that is there and there are a lot of uh, chemicals or genes uh, uh, that are implicated in 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 covid who are the people who are working on each of these uh, 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 uh chemicals or uh, drugs or or proteins or genes and this network essentially shows that uh, uh who are the scientists who are working the size of a bubble essentially uh, uh shows Uh, how uh, popular they are in terms of how much they have published uh, both in terms of their impact factor and the number of publications and the color coding uh, tells you which country they are from so uh, this is another uh, feature that we have uh, put in uh, to kind of help the community uh, in 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 understanding the space uh, and similarly we have a very powerful search feature where uh, you could kind of drive the 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 search and the search is basically natural language and uh, it also puts your search term in context with everything else that has been uh, in taxila and uh, each of this again uh, the galaxy view of the search tells you that this is my search term but in context with the other information content uh, with respect to that uh, you you could understand so so the these articles are probably the most contextually relevant to the the search term that has been given and uh, and these other clusters are disparate clusters talking about different information content uh so this is a little bit about uh, the tool of taxila itself and uh, uh, i just go a little bit under the hood of uh, the, the knowledge graph and our research uh, that's uh, actually powering a lot of this uh, so as i said one of the focus areas that we have is uh, how do you generate new hypotheses from text uh, and uh, Uh, this is work that we very recently published in uh, the transaction of uh, uh, the tkd uh, uh, where uh, the idea was uh, if we model uh, the publications as a knowledge graph uh, then uh, having a new hypothesis is about new link prediction and uh, we have come up with a neural network based system which allows uh, to kind of model this temporal evolution 
of, uh, uh, of networks and new hypotheses amount to new edge formations within this network. And uh, we've shown that our method, which we call as the temporal uh, pair encoding, uh, is currently doing uh, the state of the art in terms of uh, the performance of this model. And uh, uh, we also use that on, on the COVID data set in terms of saying, hey, uh, and the good thing of our uh, technique is before the, it also allows for new keywords being allowed into the system. And uh, we trained on data of the uh, COD19 data set, and we found uh, some interesting uh, observations of uh, how or what uh, the keyword of COVID was related to in terms of a hypothesis. And uh, so with this, I'd like to kind of quickly, uh, 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 sorry, I rushed through the presentation, but uh, I'd like to kind of stop and take any questions. That's it. Thank you, uh, Sushi. So we do have several questions. Just to remind to all attendees, uh, there are no live questions. So please type your questions in questions and answer uh, field. And if we don't have time to answer, the speaker will answer after that uh, by texting. So one of the questions, thanks for the presentation. Uh, can you adapt the web page uh, for other browsers? Because not many rely, rely on Chrome. Yeah, uh, so thank you for that question. Yes, uh, uh, we are, uh, so currently, as you correctly uh, saw, it's uh, primarily on uh, uh, Chrome and uh, uh, Edge browsers. So our team is now working on uh, uh, getting it to the Firefox as well. So very soon we'll be uh, moving to Firefox. It's just a little bit of a technical issue, but uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, next question. Can uh, Taxia help distinguish false information regarding COVID? Yes. Uh, so in fact, one of the uh, things that, I mean, I, I did not have enough time to present is essentially the, the knowledge graph that is powering a lot of the taxila. And uh, uh, just like we have a mechanism for, uh, uh, for uh, new hypothesis generation, uh, we also have models that kind of weigh uh, scientific uh, uh, information or scientific uh, uh, rigor into, into, in, in these publications when we are building these networks. And uh, that is one way we are trying to kind of uh, uh, use it to kind of uh, uh, look at the, the information uh, mismatch, if you will, uh, 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 that is there. But generally, this is a, a hard problem, and uh, we are working on that. I have a question for myself, using this yeah. opportunity to be chairman. Um, uh, can you retrieve also mechanistic information? So, for example, linking search not only for uh, to uh, text mining, but also through uh, databases of pathways. Uh, it is theoretically, uh, I mean, it's possible, uh, Ina, but uh, currently we don't. I mean, as a part of the COVID Taxila platform, uh, we are focusing only on the dimension of text. But in our other uh, research uh, projects, we uh, typically work on combining structured information and structure, unstructured information in text. Uh, to kind of use that to augment uh, the, the, the endpoints that we are looking at. So it's possible, but at this point, we have not done it. Okay, and the very last uh, question, how do you filter the articles? Uh, so what do you consider initially? Uh, so initially, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a good point. So what we do, uh, uh, Ina, is initially, uh, the way we set this up is we have an editorial team who says, Hey, this is uh, information content coming from here is good quality. So we then configure our system to kind of every day get this information from this uh, uh, from this uh, uh, source. Uh, so in this case, for instance, if any new clinical trial is presented, any new scientific publication is presented. But I think the challenge, I think the more pertinent challenge is let's say archive. These are things that are not uh, 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 essentially peer reviewed. And these are very early results. And there might be a lot of issues with some of these results. And in this case, currently, we use, uh, as I said, uh, the kind of uh, knowledge graph that we have to kind of refine it. But it's not uh, something that we have fully uh, solved, essentially. OK, thank you. We need to move to the next uh, talk. Uh, thank you very much. Please continue typing answers. There are questions coming and coming, I said. So thanks, sure. yeah. please unshare your screen. And we invite uh, Desco. Modos from Rathen Institute uh, from United uh, Kingdom uh, to share the screen. Please, Desko, share the, your screen. 
switch on your camera and microphone. I am doing hi. Hello. Uh, so properly. And do you see my screen and myself as well? That's perfect. So then, hi everyone, I am Dezső Modos and I am from the Kocsmáros group from the Erlen and the Kodram Institute and I would like to talk about a bit of uh, intra and intercellular networks and how we can use them to facilitate network medicine and decipher diseases. So to do such a thing, the first thing is we need a proper database and I know that from here in the audience and in the presenters, there are many people who are collecting think, uh, think, uh, uh, data sets such as in PT pathways, in uh, Reactome, and all of these, these things. And uh, we also are, are developing with the ESRS group, uh, Leocides Rodriguez, the Omnipath database, which collects all of these together and make them ready for you to, to uh, use and uh, download through Cytoscape, uh, R, and uh, uh, Python. And I would love to show you, you two applications that how you can use the, the Omnipath uh, datasets in, in the case of ulcerative colitis, and also that what will be the new features, which are one of the most important new features of the, the right now under development Omnipath 2 database. So, first of all, let's see that what is this, this new feature. It will have the intercellular uh, interactions between, uh, between cells. It will contain, contain various uh, uh, databases and we will have the annotation from uh, all of the proteins in this protein-protein interaction database, from what is a ligand, what is a receptor, to uh, what are various transporters, and all of the, the other parts which, which you will need to understand the intercellular communication. And you know that the, the, all of these data, databases are contain only a fraction of the, the information and you will need to, to put them all together to get a bit larger coverage and the Omnipass 2 will, will be, be do that. And we have actually checked a lot of these interactions with uh, uh, the team, team to try to make some kind of quality control for the intercellular uh, 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 interactions. The, in uh, the next part, I will go for, for back to the intracellular uh, uh, data sets and how we have used only pass for in the case of uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, ulcerative colitis is uh, one of the inflammatory bowel diseases. It's attacks from the colon and uh, crawls up on the gastrointestinal tract and uh, makes uh, uh, inflammations. And we don't know really that how is it caused, because what are the uh, real causes of the disease. And some patients needs only a tablet, another one will needs to remove it for uh, large intestine. And we don't know that which one is which. We want to be sure that there are genetic basis of it. So we want to find that how these genetic factors are interacting, and that's how where we will use the uh, Omnipass and the, the interactions. We have uh, collected the patient-specific single nucleotide polymorphisms and mapped them to transcription factor binding site or microRNA target site, so basically regulatory single nucleotide polymorphisms, and see that which one of those genes, genes are uh, in Omnipath, which are uh, having these these uh, uh, transcription factor or micro uh, or RNA target site, which is altered, and see their interactor partners as well. To do that, we have used the database, and then we have integrated the network work data and done the uh, patient specific uh, uh, clustering. Now, I will, will want to show you that how, how it looks like when we will go further. So, this one is when we have the SNP affected proteins and the, uh, their interactor partners for all of these roughly 600 patients. This is how their network looks like. And we have modularized this network and we have here the NF-kappa-B module and the protein kinase c beta module. These are this based on that, that clustered the patients and anything which is yellow, it's either directly involved as a SNP affected protein or their interactor partner. And if there is a yellow line, those are the interactors of, of that particular their uh, proteins. So we had four clusters. One of them will be, be the protein kinase C beta positive and it's a SNP effect. 
the other one then we have the NF kappa B and the second one, third one is the NF kappa B and protein kinase B and the fourth one then that is non replacement effective. The NF kappa B is the main transcription factor of inflammation and the protein kinase beta is upstream com uh, compared to it. So that's why, why they are very important in ulcerative colitis. And when we will look at these networks, we have expected that they will have some kind of, of different clinical parameters, but they did not have at all. They have exactly the same clinical parameters in the case. What was interesting is in that because the protein kinase beta is upstream compared to the NF kappa B, then uh, when we will, will target the NF kappa B maybe by some kind of drug, then we can maybe we expect some kind of effect. But if the downstream part is, is affected, then we will probably not so sure that we will have, have uh, some kind of effect. And also the same thing for, for uh, the, the uh, when we, these half proteins are not, not affected at all. So that's why we will, we will need such network biological groups to finding, trying to figure out that where to, where to will, will need to target for patient specific thing. Okay, so that was the intracellular part. Now we will go to the intercellular uh, uh, data sets. We will still go uh, uh, using ulcerative colitis, but we will go to the uh, newest version of OMIPA and how we have used that. Here we have the, uh, we use single cell RNA-seq data to do this. We have the two cell types. And then we will need to know that which uh, genes are expressed, which genes are present in, in one particular cells. Uh, to do that, we, the, the RNA-C can be used as a proxy, and then we can see that which genes are, are uh, presenting. And then from that, we can make cell-specific networks for cell A and cell B, and then use the Omnipath database to get and connect the two uh, cells. So we have done this in ulcerative colitis and healthy gut uh, case. We have chosen these five cells because these were, were involved in, in uh, UC. You can see that here are the interactions are how strongly interacting that specific cell from one cell to the other. You can see that in healthy gut case, everything is going towards the dendritic cells, which is uh, very, very, very interesting. The dendritic cells are the antigen presenting cells in, in normally in in, uh, uh, in uh, the gut. But it's a change in UC. Uh, the interactions were going towards the regulatory T cells, cells. So those cells which normally are decreasing the inflammation, but now they are getting a much bigger signals. We also looked into this edge, the myofibroblast T-Rex cell, cell edge a bit more details to see that how they are, are, are different. Do they differ? Uh, between the, these two conditions. And we, to do that, we have just basically seen that what are the ligands and the receptors. These are the specific uh, receptors. Three minutes, that have these. I, have, um, I have two minutes, yeah. And uh, uh, the healthy and the, the, the receptors. In this case, they have more or less the same amount. But if we look at downstream, two steps in the, uh, in the network and see that what pathways they will be involved. They will have used for that reactor pathway enrichment. We found in the healthy case, they are more or less immunosuppressive pathways from these, the, that kind of toll-like receptors. And in the uh, uh, inflamed case, they, are, they were those toll-like receptors which were were uh, more, in, more inflammation promoting in that case. So in conclusion, we will need these large secondary and tertiary database such as Omnipath for, for uh, understanding the intra and intracell intracellular communications. We have, I have shown that the, how we can use network biology and single nucleotide polymorphisms to uncover multiple disease pathways. And uh, uh, the single cell RNA-seq data sets to the network biology can compare and can make cell-specific data, and we can show they, the, how they are rewired in the, with the intercellular communications. And uh, downstream, as well, we have seen that how they have specific pathway signatures for the, you know, whether they are healthy or, or inflamed. inflamed. And at the end, I would like us to uh, thank for everyone one day to listening and enough for, for for having me here and every colleague of mine for, for uh, their, their, their uh, works. And I'm looking forward to the question.
questions. Thank you for a very interesting talk. So there is a question here where we can, uh, where you can cluster your construct to be multidimensional uh, and be based on more than one molecule, for example. Uh, you, mean, you mean by multidimensional in that sense that uh, uh, here they are clustered by based on the network. And yeah, we could, we could, uh, could add let's say microRNA or, or some other additional things. We didn't do that, but that can be a good idea. That's the question, I understood it correctly. Uh, I have a question uh, about uh, multi-omic data. So I understand that mm -hmm. here it's based on one type of data, whether you can take into account others, so phosphoproteome, uh, I don't know, et cetera, et cetera, lipidome, for example. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. So the, here we, we used only, the, here we have basically two omics data which we are trying to connect. The, one of them is the transcriptomics and one of the, the other one is the genomics data from the patients. Ideally, the, the next step will be the, uh, when we will have these two together. The phosphoproteomics, that will be again as well the next step, but we right now don't have have the data sets, sets, but especially for network biological studies, I absolutely agree that would be a very, very important and, and uh, work to, going towards to, to that, uh, to using Zim. Uh, every, every other, and so basically the transcriptomics is just a proxy for the proteomics, which we have seen, seen but uh, the resolution of the transcriptomics is a bit better in, in the single cell levels right now compared to the, the proteomics. Uh, next question is whether the Omnipath interactions are notated uh, with uh, cell types uh, and how they may interact through, or uh, these interactions that are in Omnipath um, demand direct physical contact? They are, they, they are direct physical contacts. So they are, they are by PPIs. The um, cell, cell, cell interactions shows here, they are coming from a, a other data source from a, from a, a, another a single cell NASIC experiment. In Omnipath, you can actually be filter on, uh, on uh, certain cell uh, specific databases, which are, are telling you that whether they are expressed the uh, certain proteins. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks for your answers and for your talk. There are more uh, questions are coming, so just text uh, your answers, please unshare your screen. And then we invite uh, to the stage uh, Marek Ostarewski from LCSB uh, Luxembourg. Please share your screen, switch on your camera and the uh, microphone. Yes, in a moment. Just sharing my screen, my video. Hi, everyone. I hope can you, you can hear me well. Slide. So, yes, that's perfect. Please. Okay, excellent. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Marek Ostaszewski from the University of Luxembourg, but uh, I'm actually presenting here on behalf of the uh, bigger group of the COVID-19 disease map community. Uh, and I will be speaking a little bit about a large effort we have undertaken to build a computational repository of host virus interactions uh, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. So um, basically, just to uh, give you a very brief intro on what the disease map is. So disease maps basically are conceptual models of diseases for knowledge-driven data interpretation and modeling. So these are um, encoding, high-quality encodings of molecular, inter uh, molecular disease mechanisms. And these are encoded using computational standards to then allow downstream analysis and processing. Disease maps have a, a visual component and they allow visual intuitive exploration and comprehensive overview of, of multiple mechanisms which are implicated in a given disease. So they provide a context. And uh, on that context, visualization of complex omics data sets allow a better interpretation of said data sets. Finally, because we have these computational standards and a lot of uh, platforms implicated in disease maps offer extensive APIs, um, these, uh, this is a basis for reproducible exploration and analysis because uh, these queries can be formulated uh, in, uh, in a programmatic way. And um, I invite you to check out a little bit more detail on the diseasemaps.org. Now, uh, for the COVID-19 disease map, basically we aimed for the same thing. We aimed for 
uh, organization of the multiple sources of knowledge and the publications into a, into a repository which then can be useful. So we started with a cycle of a construction of a disease map starts with basically the literature, so the prior knowledge uh, that we have. And uh, basically um, it starts with the curation review of the literature. This is being encoded and integrated using systems biology notations like SBGN for graphical representation and SBML for the un underlying model. And last but not least, integration with external databases of which I will speak a little bit more afterwards. And this um, organization of knowledge and, and standardization of it uh, leads to the exploration and modeling. We, we can then consume that um, into a more sophisticated analytical approaches, which then lead to scientific results, refinement of the scope of the curation, and the silk, circle repeats or continues. And uh, currently in our disease map, we are focusing on a couple of main components, which are um, SARS-CoV-2 life cycle, um, and uh, basically interactions of SARS-CoV with uh, the basic mechanisms of the host cell and the response of uh, immune adaptive and innate immune system uh, to the infection, considering in the future to include also repair and recovery mechanisms of the virus. So um, we have, uh, when we started to construct the map, we have reached out through our scientific networks to ask if people would be interested in contributing to the project and participating uh, in it. And we got a very enthusiastic and tremendous response. Uh, currently, uh, over 200 people um, vouched that they would be interested in joining the project. They represent over 100 institutions in 30 countries. So this is, this is a, large, um, a large group of people, uh, which importantly is of multiple expertise range. We have uh, people from clinical expertise to bioinformaticians, from academic to SME so, um, environments, which basically gives us a very rich environment and um, a very fruitful discussions because uh, everyone, uh, we have this multi, multi point of view uh, group where everyone can feed and, and teach a little bit everyone else about uh, different intricacies on the clinical side or perhaps on the analytical side. Besides having the, let's say, static uh, representation of, uh, of the community or static access points uh, like web pages and, of course, Ferdom Hub profile, uh, we also organize weekly TCs. Um, these, are, um, these are very uh, enriching discussions uh, between, uh, between all sorts of uh, experts on, um, on, in, in our group uh, focused on curation and analysis but um, everyone participates and everyone has a, has a chance to contribute and, and learn a bit. So uh, the three main areas of focus of the, of the project uh, are on the curation and content sharing, integration and interoperability of said content, and then the consumption of it through analysis and, mod and modeling. So for the curation, we try to ensure quality of this uh, manually built diagrams and uh, retaining the provenance of representative knowledge such that parallel efforts, because we have multiple curation teams working together uh, and uh, developing content simultaneously, they need to, this content has to have similar quality or, or a similar, a similar level of representation of molecular mechanisms. So uh, this requires certain coordination. Uh, on um, this content being produced, it's important to, uh, to be interchangeable exactly because we have multiple parallel teams working using often different tools. And it means that the outputs of these tools have to be um, interoperable. We need to be able to use uh, the content produced by other teams such that we have a, a consistent repository. And then um, basically this curated uh, content pretty much into what Desha was just representing just a moment ago has to be uh, enriched by interaction databases and text mining platforms because we cannot curate that manually everything. But having a decent or, uh, or constant uh, integration with uh, interaction databases and text mining allows to have, have this enrichment process to find something which is beyond the literature. And of course, all of this has to be, uh, has to be, e be easily accessible. Finally, this integrated and, uh, and available content has to be possible to be uh, 
analyzed by, uh, uh, by, uh, by experts for prediction hypothesis generation, but also feedback to the curators in order to uh, inform if the content has certain, certain, uh, certain mankaments. So something that can be improved uh, in the process of building that can facilitate modeling. This is a very uh, important feedback loop and which is, um, which is uh, sometimes neglected. So uh, let me guide you to this complex picture. All these interactions uh, give, uh, give us a very complex and, and interconnected ecosystem. And um, on the left, you have the curation area where curators produce the diagram using different platforms. Uh, Wiki Pathways and React Home are standalone platforms. We also produce individual diagrams using Cell Designer and SBGN uh, oriented tools. So uh, these are stored in GitLab. But uh, because we have uh, exchange and uh, integration interfaces, uh, all these are, um, are interoperable. Now, uh, because of that, uh, this content, this interoperable content can be translated into different formats, which are then used for analysis, as you see in the bottom right corner, uh, from SBML and, uh, and uh, you could say modeling um, uh, approaches to basically more uh, specific uh, formats allowing network analysis. And last but not least, integration of text mining and interaction DBs um, basically gives us this uh, fantastic enrichment of manually built content uh, by, uh, by databases and basically by, by bigger repositories to, to, um, where the diagrams we construct act as a filter for these large repositories and the large repositories enrich our content. So uh, coming back to curation and content sharing, just to tell you a little bit. So currently we have 21 diagrams submitted to date for the COVID-19 disease map. On Wiki Pathways, there are 18 diagrams available. And on Reactome, uh, there is a large diagram published specific for SARS-CoV-1 mechanisms, but uh, basically extendable towards SARS-CoV-2 after more knowledge and more data is available. So basically, uh, this looks, um, just to, as a glimpse of an eye, this looks like this. Uh, I was able to produce this picture as a basically a patchwork of different diagrams. They look disjoint, but because of the integration efforts that we have, they are basically interconnected and interoperable. So you are able to search across them. You are able to put them all together into a, a bigger network and refine it um, using, using different approaches. Precisely because of that, uh, what I'm about to say. So for the format inter interchange, we have different systems biology layout formats. So that allow to encode diagrams starting from Cell Designer, SBG and ML formats, SBML with layout and render and GPML. What's important is that in our infrastructure, we are able to um, exchange between any two of them, which basically gives us a, a very powerful setup that everyone coming with their tools and having a single entry point can have access or basically can benefit from, from, the, other, from the other sources. Um, these uh, diagrams are also, of course, ex um, uh, exportable to CIF, uh, simpler formats, network formats, uh, usable by, uh, by Cytoscape or other, uh, other tools which, which uh, focus on graph analysis of, of networks. And finally, the modeling content with SBML and SBML qual availability of, uh, of what is being produced. Uh, interactions, the databases and text mining uh, were basically, uh, uh, I was mentioning before, give us suggestions for curation and allow to complete network models. And it's, uh, it's very nice that, uh, to see that uh, Desho was, was presenting because with his help, we were able to integrate, for instance, Omnipath. Uh, I believe Luana is going to speak about Senor, which, which, is, also, uh, which is also possible to be integrated and, uh, uh, into, together with our diagrams. So uh, this is uh, an ongoing process of, um, uh, of enrichment of, of handmade content. And finally, the easy access, uh, all the content is web-based, visualized, uh, either using Wiki, Wiki Pathways or React Home native platforms, or uh, the individual diagrams are also visualized using uh, the Minerva platform. There is API access or programmatic access to all the content. Um, um, 
making it uh, very programmatically proce processable. And finally, uh, in our dedicated GitLab repository, we, we basically give examples of conversion scripts, allowing uh, users to have an easy access to the, uh, to the content. Last but not least, certain analysis and modeling uh, efforts have been started in our, um, uh, in our group or in, in our community. Uh, as you see, uh, these come from network analysis, uh, through Boolean modeling, uh, down to kinetic, kinetic modeling. And these efforts use the current content of the map, which is still being refined. So the conclusions, perhaps, which we draw from these are not uh, at the level we would like it to have, because we would like to have a more mature resource, we are still getting there. But because we are able to develop the analytical pipelines in parallel, it gives us two, uh, two mm, huge advantages. First of all, um, when the, the mature content arrives, we will also have our pipelines in place and we'll be able to process and, uh, and, uh, and analyze the outputs uh, quickly. Second of all, because of that, we are able to feed back to content providers and say, uh, um, and uh, inform them about um, what, uh, what standardization efforts should be improved for the modeling to benefit more from, uh, uh, from, from the diagrams. So to summarize, uh, to summarize the, the presentation, um, the COVID-19 disease map project, uh, it's a community-driven effort uh, where we try to encode and investigate mechanisms of COVID-19. Uh, we were able to bring together different experts and this was a very enriching uh, exercise. Uh, and I'm sure that every community member was able to gain something from this collaboration, seeing other people's engagement and, and area of work. And finally, where we are, uh, where we are going is uh, building a transparent and reproducible content for systems biomedicine analysis, uh, stressing the fact of interoperability and access. So uh, if you're interested to learn a little bit more about us, uh, we have uh, our webpage and, uh, and the Fedom Hub profile, uh, where basically we introduce all the community members and, and our current status of work. Uh, let me uh, end this by acknowledging a lot of people who helped us. So first and foremost, the Disease Maps community, all the contributors uh, from the curator, curators through the domain experts, the clinical, uh, clinical experts, life scientists, and down to the bioinformaticians who, uh, who work with the content and, and improve our understanding of analytical capabilities of the entire project. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy to see a lot of them presenting today. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Fedom Hub team for their relentless support of our project and uh, also a uh, responsible and reproducible research team from the University of Luxembourg for their immediate response and our request for infrastructure. To, to support the project. And finally, um, this, was not, this would have not been possible without a, a, a great um, a feedback and a positive feedback from, uh, from different engaged Elixir nodes. So uh, thanks again, and I'll be uh, more than happy to take your questions. Thanks, Marek. Uh, there are several questions. Um, uh, what about the duplicated interactions coming from various resources that have different weight of score and this course uh, are these scores are preserved in the final integration into the disease map uh, this is a step which we still need to do and uh, this is a very uh, important um, this is a very important remark uh, because we have those parallel efforts uh, at the curation level uh, we are um, we are uh, keeping these diagrams um, physically you could say separate we don't combine them because the further curation would be very cumbersome. As for integration of external databases, this is a very fair point because uh, they are different interactions, they have different weight. Um, actually, we could combine them and uh, con contrast them with, uh, with the curated diagrams and, and see if we are able to use this multiple interaction or text mining databases to verify um, certain connections within the diagrams to give them uh, more weight to, uh, to confirm their, uh, their correctness or flag uh, conflicting, uh, conflicting uh, curation outcomes. So this is still uh, ahead of us, but it's a very, very important remark. In a way, right? You're talking Again? about 
you're talking about the confidence score in a way. Uh, indeed, uh, we are talking about the confidence score uh, from the external databases. It could also be combined uh, with uh, external data sets, omics data sets, uh, perhaps following the, mm, the approach that Desha was presenting uh, just before. Uh, overlap uh, data um, on top of the networks and see if interacting partners are there and their sign is similar. Next question. Uh, so you export uh, COVID-19 map in uh, RDF. Uh, what ontologies are you using? What IDs to specify uh, the entities? Okay, uh, so this is, this is in our curation guidelines. Um, uh, basically, uh, there are a couple of, uh, you could say, near equivalent uh, annotations. But what we do is we rely on, um, for, human, uh, for human mechanisms, we re rely on AGNC for, for genes and, and mRNA, Uniprot for proteins, uh, KB, uh, PubChem uh, for, for small molecules, gene ontology mesh for, for phenotypic and, and uh, upper scale data. Basically, we rely on Miriam slash identifiers.org scheme to, uh, to properly frame the, the identifiers in their scope. So if, if this is being handled in the downstream translation to RDF, I think this is going to be, uh, to be preserved. So uh, at this moment, we are uh, agnostic to, um, but it's basically we follow all the ontologies supported by identifiers.org, you could say. In the last question, you also spoke about API access. If you have RDF store, do you have a Sparkle uh, endpoint as well? Uh, the RDF store is something that we plan, that we are in the process of establishing via the discussion with the Wiki Pathways team. So uh, if, if there would be any RDF store, I would uh, direct the question at Tina, who is going to speak a little bit later today. Uh, but I believe that Wiki Pathways do offer Sparkle endpoint and um, uh, this would be accessible. On top of that, uh, the content of all the diagrams about uh, their elements and their interactions, uh, um, at least in the, for the independent diagrams, uh, it's also accessible via API. So at this moment, I think that we already have a, a decent endpoint to, uh, to um, extract interaction level data and their annotations. Thanks. So uh, uh, there are many questions. I'll let you to answer by typing. Thanks a lot. And uh, unshare your screen, please. We invite on the stage uh, Angela Ba uh, from uh, Biomax Informatics in Germany. Please, Angela, share your screen, camera on and microphone on. Excellent. Just make Hello it to everybody. Easy. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, thanks for yeah, giving me the opportunity to present Ailani. Ailani stands actually for Artificial Intelligence Language Interface and is a semantic search platform that combines and connects multiple data resources and the technology of Ailani actually um, is based on linguistics, ontologies, artificial intelligence and semantic modeling. And you have here um, access also publicly, it's, we made it publicly available since the beginning of May and many of you in the audience already have access to this instance. And you can ask Ailani all kind of questions such as, yeah, what does camostat inhibit or how to prevent cytokine storms with COVID-19 infections or how does source coronavirus enter the cell? The entry page is, yeah, an easy, yeah, we have an intuitive graphical user interface where you can have a search box where you enter keywords, uh, search phrases, or also natural language questions. And here you're then redirected to the results page where you're presented with documents which you can further refine using these here colorful sunburst diagrams which are built actually on ontologies. So this uh, displaying the hierarchical structures of ontologies. So the innermost circle is actually the highest uh, hierarchy within the ontologies. And we have uh, filters or refiners based on chemistry, uh, pathways, chemistry, coronaviruses, and so on. 
And we also have the function here, as you see here, these smart breadcrumbs. And with each refining step, an additional colored breadcrumb is, into, is created and you can follow your uh, search journey. And these are automatically stored in your search history and can also be used to creating alerts uh, as soon as the content uh, is being changed. So we additionally, we constantly index new articles within Ailani. And here, yeah, we have on one side the keyword results, uh, which represents uh, uh, retrieves documents, and we have AI suggestions, so direct answers to your natural language post question. Here, this is actually the background of Filani under the hood. So it's based on a big semantic network, a world graph and input. We have different types of data sources. We have structured data sources, such as Medline Abstract, PubMed Central Full Texts, as well as patents. But it can also be unstructured data like, um, yeah, in-house documents, your Word uh, files, your PowerPoint files, or news archives. And these data are then subjected also to special data detectors. We also apply uh, for chemical extraction, no, to extract chemical information, optical character and optical structure recognition. And all this information contributes to this continuously growing uh, semantic network, which is then subjected to tagging and indexing, allowing for global search. So we have an um, AI search, which is really a combination of classical NLP query parser and a machine learning system and then complemented with a sophisticated concept search and subsequent manual filtering. In addition, we also have a chemical search, which allows you to search for chemical structures within the integrated databases, as well to uh, identify structures which have been previously extracted from your documents of interest. So what is the exact content sources of COVID-19 Ailani? So we have the full set of Medline abstracts, a set of 2 million PubMed Central articles, clinicaltrials.gov. We have the COVID-19 literature, so the whole core 19 sets, so Elsevier, the preprint um, server papers, news feeds. And recently, we also have added a set of more than yeah, 4,000 COVID-19 related patterns. And as mentioned earlier, we can extend it by your proprietary documents, Word, PowerPoint files, or electronic lab notebooks. We have integrated around 70 public databases, yeah, the usual suspects such as Uniprot, KnowledgeBase, PubChem, Campbell, DragBank, uh, ICD-10, DBSNP, and so forth. But it can be extended, you know, by proprietary structured databases, your antibody inventory, your IP portfolio, for example. And the whole system works really on ontologies. This is our work uh, force. We have integrated about 120 life science ontologies, examples like the disease ontology, gene ontology, the NC by taxonomy, KB, FMA, or the human phenotype. And this can be extended by proprietary ontologies or um, existing proprietary can be extended for your um, ontologies. So um, what does such a knowledge graph look like? So the semantic network consists actually of ontology relations. And here the, they're hierarchically built. If here we have, for instance, the protein uh, as a parent concept, a child concept would be the protein kinase. In turn, we have, for instance, the receptor protein kinase, the non-receptor protein kinase, and these in turn then have individuals like the EGF receptor as a receptor protein kinase, and here for non-receptor protein kinase, this would be like uh, the JAK kinase, FIN, LIN, or ABLE, and these in turn then are linked then to um, DNA uh, elements, which in turn then have other links to cross links to other databases. And the uh, question answering insects is actually a combination now of semantic networks and neural networks, which we call actually the hybrid AI, which combines prior knowledge uh, contained within the ontologies and reasoning and generalization from the, from the extracted triples and combining neural networks. 
And this really finds still yet unknown concepts. And as an example, let's see here by entering the question, what does camostat inhibit? We have here direct answers which are provided by Alani, such as here the receptor TMPRSS2, which is actually the receptor which is targeted by camostat. Camostat is actually a serine protease inhibitor which has been approved for pancreatic inflammation. And here another answer is that camostat inhibits the SARS coronavirus cell entry and that it inhibits also pancreatic cancer. And in addition to retrieving direct answers to your question, we also have uh, documents which are retrieved. Here, for instance, if we enter the keyword camostat, we have a set of um, documents from all the content sources I have indicated earlier. And here they are ranked automatically by, by, by relevance. So those where we have the most significant concept matches are presented first. We have the option for manual drill down using these sunburst controls. Here in this example is, the, is based on the disease ontologies. And here the size of these pi pieces indicates the number of results within the whole document. So this is calculated always on the fly. And as you see here, by refining your search, uh, the highlighting of respiratory system disease is also um, based on synonym expansion, based on all currently annotated synonyms. And these are these breadcrumbs which allow you also to uh, refine your searches and rerun them and create alerts. So what is the, the underlying algorithm? So we have the NLP question answering system, which consists of the NLP parser, which analyzes the grammatical structure of an entered language question. Then the entered question is translated into a query against all previously extracted beliefs. And finally, we have an answer generator um, retrieving then the triples. And the AI question answering system is actually, um, from all documents, we actually extract a candidate set of four sentence chunk chunks. And these are actually then um, yeah, um, used or generated by using the semantic tagging index. And also ontologies are used actually for ranking this is also why a good quality of your ontology has an influence on the quality of the answers within the system. And then these, from this candidate set of four sentence chunks, a neural network actually extract direct answers to the entered questions. And based on the machine learning score, the answers are then reported in a ranked order. So now let's see um, with this the following question how to inhibit cytokine storm in COVID-19 infection, how we can explore the answer also within the knowledge graph. So here, by entering this question, we retrieve a couple of uh, answers. One is interesting one is here, ruxolitinib. Ruxolitinib is actually a drug which is approved for myelofibrosis, which was approved in 2011, and which is currently also being, um, yeah, evaluated for the treatment also for COVID-19. On the right, we have here um, the inf additional information, chemical information, we have the structure information and additional chemical properties of this compound. And we also have access here to the knowledge graph, which is here, this is actually an excerpt or a zoom in of the whole semantic network, which we're continuously growing and curating and generating. And here we have the option also by um, selecting any edge or node that we have additional information, such as uh, information uh, about the relation and the evidence. And by selecting one of the evidences, we can go into detail and seeing here rutuximab inhibits the PBMC proliferation. And we have also linked to the original literature source. We can also extend these knowledge graphs. For instance, uh, an associated uh, concept like mononuclear cell proliferation can be used to extend the knowledge graph. 
This is the original graph, which has been now extended to uh, interactions from this one. And you can further explore from there. We also have a chemicals perspective of Vailani. For instance, we can uh, search, uh, use a chemical search, this is a specific search of Vailani, by uh, using this ChemDraw tool. You either can draw it manually or you upload a file, a MOL file or a SDF file of interest. And here we can have do identity, similarity or substructure searches. In this case, it's a similarity search and results are sorted by default by similarity score. And here we also have links to actually documents or patterns where the structure drawing has been mentioned. So which has been previously been instructed by optical structure recognition. And here we are redirected then in this example to a patent which was actually filed in 2016. And here, if you scroll down, we also have additional structures here which have been extracted from this patent in addition to ruxolitinib. We always have also a link to the page of the patent where this structure of interest was extracted. And we have the option actually for users or curators actually to curate and evaluate if the structure which was extracted is correct or is it wrong and to provide a correct uh, structure. In addition, we also have sequence information. We automatically um, extract also concepts or ontology entries from the relevant um, um, research areas. And if possible, if there are existing, we also have therapies associated to this, the compound of interest. Yeah, to conclude, so from this question, how to inhibit cytokine storm in COVID-19 infection, I showed you that we can find inhibitors uh, relevant to COVID-19 infection, explore the knowledge graph, get also chemical and patent perspective from a potential drug. And actually from the with the COVID-19 disease map collaboration, which Marek uh, presented earlier, we enrich actually networks of this molecular SARS-CoV-2 infection processes by literature mining evidence, gene drug associations, or gene disease associations. We have an API from which we can really extract all this kind of data. We also have gene interactions. And lately, we also have integrated here the patent information, which is also available. And here I would like to acknowledge, yeah, in particular, the COVID-19 disease map community, especially Marek, Anna, and Ina, and also the Biomax colleagues, uh, which have been developing Ailani. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Angela. Uh, uh, we will take one question, and there are many here. So is it like a bio-specific Google searching engine? Can you describe a bit more the engine, please? Um, it's more specific because we use these ontologies which are really um, scientifically, so yeah, life science specific. It, it's comparable maybe to Google, but since the content is more specific and the ontologies, we are um, yeah, retrieving more precise uh, um, results. Thanks. There are many other questions. I'll let you to type uh, uh, in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, we uh, invite to the stage Elena Svis from uh, UNIL, uh, Switzerland. And uh, please share uh, your screen. Camera on and the microphone on. I think uh, uh, it was supposed to be a, a video presentation. Oh, with your presentation. So, okay. Mine is pre recorded, yes. Yeah, so it's me who has to, to share them. Wait just a second. Um, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elena Chukis. I'm a bioinformatics researcher from the Institute of Computer Science, University of
We don't hear it. I cannot hear anything. I'm sorry. Same here. Uh, sorry, I restart the video. It was my mistake. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elena Shugis. I'm a bioinformatics researcher from the Institute of Computer Science, University of Tartu. And today, with uh, Professor Yanis Xenarius from the University of Ladan, I will present uh, our study that we have conducted in the frames of four-year research project called Aged Brain Cisbio. The aim of the project uh, was to study Alzheimer's disease and describe its molecular mechanisms from various angles. And uh, our, our work was published in um, Nature Scientific Data Journal last year. So if it is relevant to your research, please have a look. It's in all the next publication. Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder that affects uh, mostly elderly individuals and it is characterized by severe memory loss and decline in cognitive functions. Disease progresses with age and eventually leads to death. Unfortunately, currently there is no cure for the disease, so that is why it's important to study its molecular mechanisms. In the Western world, around um, around 10% of elderly population after age 65 is affected by this uh, disease. And so, when we study biological process uh, such as a disease, uh, we want to create its computational representation. And in order to do it, uh, we either produce novel data or reuse existing data sets. And then apply suitable analysis methods to, to obtain representation of the disease from each data type. However, in order to get a systematic view on this disease, individual bits of information are needed to be combined. In our study, we have addressed this issue by creating a harmonized uh, novel integrated data resource related specifically to Alzheimer's disease. And we are really hoping that researchers could effectively work with it. And also in the second part of our work, we have demonstrated how this data collection could be analyzed using a state-of-the-art deep learning method. All the information about creation of this data collection and analysis is available at the Project GitHub repository, so please feel free to go and have a look. In this study, we have combined 64 datasets related to Alzheimer's disease. These datasets are of six data types and originating from nine data sources. Part of these datasets were created by the partners of HBrainSys project, and another part uh, of these datasets were collected from public repositories and then rigorously processed. So we have applied transformation-based data integration and transformed all of our individual uh, datasets into an intermediate form of a graph. And the first group of uh, datasets in our collection consists of co-expression, protein-protein interactions, and epistasis. From each individual dataset, we construct individual graphs where nodes are genes, uh, SNPs, and proteins, and the edges represent biological relations between these nodes, such as co-expression, epistatic interactions, and physical interactions between proteins. Besides novel protein-protein interactions related to brain aging and uh, co-expression in Alzheimer's disease, one of the interesting features of HANA collection is the set of 49 epistatic data sets. So epistasis is an effect of interactions between two or more SNPs of uh, different genes on uh, phenotype, deviating from their individual effects. And these effects are especially interesting in cases of complex traits, uh, such as Alzheimer's disease. And for example, change in ventricle volume detected on patient MRI can serve as an indicator of brain tissue loss during the progression of dementia. And in this case, we can identify uh, epistatic effects of pair of SNPs on change uh, in this ventricle volume that they detected in uh, MRI. Additionally, a uh, second group of uh, datasets in HENA contains biological information regarding genes such as in which brain region 
that is expressed and uh, if it has been linked to the disease via Chivas study and also information about evolutionary study from positive selection indicating whether the gene is um, uh, associated with disease propagation during evolution. I've mentioned earlier that we have used transformation-based data integration and transformation-based data integration requires a unifying feature for the integration. And because these entities, biological entities like genes, proteins, and SNPs have different identifiers uh, shown in uh, different colors on the slide, in order to combine individual graphs, we need to map these individual identifiers to a common namespace. And in this study, we have mapped all individual identifiers to unique ensemble uh, gene identifiers. And after mapping, we aggregate all our individual uh, data sets into a form of heterogeneous graph where nodes represent genes and multiple edges depict all type of interactions. Each node in this graph is accompanied by a set of node attributes and node attributes include information about the gene, about each gene from Chivas studies, its expression in 231 brain regions from Allen Brain Atlas, like including disease associated brain regions and positive selection data. Uh, so this heterogeneous graph together with node attributes constitute a HENA data collection. HENA stands for Heterogeneous Network-Based Dataset for Alzheimer's Disease. It is accessible via Network Data Exchange Repository that is a standardized repository for network structured data. And um, HENA contains around 63 million edges and 25,000 nodes. So this is a large data set. However, on this um, uh, data repository, you can uh, filter out part of the data set and download it and use it, for example, from your site, open it from Sitescape. Additionally, a uh, table version uh, of this table is available in a uh, Figshare uh, data repository that you the link for it you can find in the publication. Okay. So this concludes the first part of my presentation regarding creation of the data collection. And the next logical question to ask is what can I do with this data? How can I infer new knowledge from it? And to study if novel information about the disease can be inferred from HENA, we attempted to identify new genes that were associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we also aim to understand if network representation of heterogeneous uh, data would be useful in this task. And so, for this task, we label genes in the dataset as positive, representing disease-related genes and proteins, negative, representing essential non-disease genes from evolutionary meta-study by Sputter and colleagues, and the rest, genes in HENA are marked as unknown because we don't know information about their association with the disease. So we want to build a classification model to predict the class of these genes. In recent years, convolutional neural networks were shown to be effective in application to the analysis of large volumes of images, text, speech, and so on. In image Application, the main idea is to build a representation of pixel using information from its neighboring pixels. However, due to the lack of uh, consistent order structure in graphs and its possible dynamic change, the application of convolutional neural networks are not so straightforward on graph structured data. The workaround for such problem is proposed in a set of deep learning methods developed specifically for graph structured data called graph convolutional networks. One of these methods called GraphSage reintroduces convolution to graphs by collecting the information from a set of local neighbors of a node and later uses this information to predict node label. Uh, for each node, it samples node neighborhood of a given distance, aggregates features from all these uh, neighboring nodes and propagates it through uh, the graph to build a representation of a node and then uses this representation to classify it. Uh, however, GraphSage is created for uh, homogeneous graphs which only have one type of uh, relations between the node and cannot be directly applied to 
heterogeneous graphs such as HINA. Um, HINSAGE uh, method, on the other hand, offers a solution to this problem. The key idea of this method is to apply graph sage separately to each subgraph, where edges correspond to one type of relations between the nodes. And after that, aggregate this information and classify the results. Uh, so we contributed to the development of HINSAGE by validating method using HANA dataset, that was the first biological uh, data where method was applied. We have compared HINSAGE performance on HINA with well-known machine learning algorithm called Random Forest. And although it's difficult to judge which model performs better, uh, we can notice the improvement uh, in both models uh, when using graph features in the model. So to explore the classification of results of both algorithms, we have explored the existing body of research and we have ranked the results of HINSAGE and Random Forest based on their probability to belong to positive class of Alzheimer's disease. And we have composed a list of 169 genes shown to have a strong association with the disease from uh, independent studies. Um, in our analysis, this was a part of unknown group. So these genes originate from recent independent GIVAS and uh, GIVAX studies. Uh, it contains a list of Alzheimer's disease-specific autoantibodies in human serum, a list of genes reported to be associated with Alzheimer's disease downloaded from Malacard database, and results of large integrated transcriptome study. We have uh, then checked where these genes are located in our ranked list of the results, and HINSAGE identified 154 genes from this list as disease-related, and Random Forest identified 14 genes. Among the selected lists, there were three genes from recently published Chivas studies, where all three studies proposed three novel disease candidates as most promising. And HINSAGE gave them high probabilities of being disease-associated while Random Forest didn't classify them as Alzheimer's related. So to conclude, um, in this study, we have um, generated and made publicly available Alzheimer's disease specific HENA data collection. Uh, we have created a graph convolutional model to classify genes related to Alzheimer's disease and we also demonstrated the benefits of using graph structural information in the analysis. This work would be impossible without colleagues from HBrain CISPIRE project. I would like to especially thank Professor Janis Xenarius from the University of Lodan, Dr. Heidi Peterson, and Professor Jaak Villa from the University of Tartu, and Dr. Anna Leontiva from CSIRO Data 61, and of course, BEAT Research Group, from the University of Tartu. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thanks a lot. Elena, please yeah, uh, okay. be ready for answering questions. Do you consider... Yes, um, I'm reading the question. Um, uh, so so, uh, in the network, do edges have values such as weights or similarity? Uh, they have weights, yes. Uh, a weight originates from, uh, uh, from the original data set. Or if the data sets were uh, like aggregated, then this is the aggregated weight. Uh, in the analysis, though, in, the, in deep learning analysis, then we didn't consider weights, but it can be added. Next question is how to filter these data sets? Are interactions characterized by multiple, multiple parameters or single one? Are there any suggestion on how to choose threshold, for example? Uh, in fact, we have actually two types of, uh, two, net, two versions of network. Uh, for example, uh, so each interaction type, um, for each interaction type, you have information about the resource so where it's coming from, and uh, about the score, uh, so for each individual interaction. And then uh, you can basically, yes, you can uh, uh, 
in the publication, we have described what each score means and uh, which kind of thresholds better it's better to use. For example, for the PPI interactions from Intact, uh, we were consulting our colleagues and they proposed uh, uh, strong medium interactions. So from 0 0.45 to one. So basically all this uh, individual uh, score, score thresholds are described in the publication in detail. Thanks, there are more questions. I'll let you to type the answers. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you very much. We invite uh, Luana Licata from University of Rome. Uh, Luana, please share your screen with us. Okay. And the uh, video on, uh, yeah, and we hear you. If you can put it to slide uh, show. Okay. So, hello to everybody. My name is Luana Licata. I, come, I work at the University of Tor Vergata in Bioinformatica Computational Biology. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, only a few of our resources in your and uh, briefly about Mint and how, how a data set can be used in the contextualization of molecular network for human disease. Uh, Mint is a protein-protein interaction database that stores manually curated protein-protein interaction that has been reported in peer review literature. And we annotated the, the information according to the IMEX Consortium International Standard. All our data contains several uh, metadata across reference to other resources. We are part, together with Intact, the IMEX Consortium of, uh, uh, we are an LSE core data resource. And, um, here, I mean, the, um, the MS Consortium is an, inter sorry, is an international collaboration um, and uh, there are several uh, participants in the major protein-protein uh, and molecular interaction repository like uh, INTACT, the, the IP, MINT, UNIGRONT and many others that agree on uh, sharing curation efforts using detailed curation model using a common correction rules, common controller vocabulary. We have a very high accuracy of uh, quality control procedure and uh, of course a common export format, the PSIMI XML or PSIMI tab that has been widely used by international community over the year. Very recently, a few months ago, we reached 1 million uh, interaction, a big goal for us. And here you can see, I mean, uh, there are the link where you can download uh, our data set. During the pandemic, uh, oh sorry, during the pandemic uh, crisis, uh, uh, all the IMEX uh, group decide to, um, decide to curate uh, molecular interaction that they were coming from, uh, I mean, involving SARS-CoV-2, SARS and other member of coronavirus, uh, coronavirus the family. And uh, these efforts allow us to collect uh, so far, I mean, of course, it's an ongoing project, over 4,400 molecular interaction. The database is available uh, at the intact web page. And uh, also you can see here is uh, possible uh, to, visual, to be visualized in the index uh, archive. Oops, what's going on? Okay. So why Signore is another uh, resort that has been developed uh, more recently in our uh, uh, group uh, is a signaling network open resource that collect manually annotated signaling data and capture them as a um, binary causal relationship between biological entity. All data are free to download in different format and adopt a Boolean representation of logic relationship. Okay. So how is structured data in Signor? We have give information about the entity. We have uh, uh, several molecular types that can be chemical, protein, protein family, and so on. Each molecular type is always associated to do a molecular identifier and has always a directionality. Of course, uh, the entity are uh, uh, related between them uh, by a relationship. So we collect information about the fact is either up regulated or down regulated and a mechanism that could be binding, phosphorylation, transcription, activation or any other post translation modification. And uh, sorry, I don't know why it's going like this. And um, whenever it's possible, we annotate the modified residue and the cell line and tissue where the interaction occurs. Each interaction is always associated to a PMID and a short sentence that describes the interaction. Uh, 
We don't have time to go through uh, single web page, the functionality, but I just wanted to highlight here um, these two, these two features. One is uh, the button connected, allow you, allow the user to check how the protein of, uh, of his interest, uh, two or more protein are connected inside uh, Signor, or uh, for example, the shortest path functionality that allow you to see which is the shortest path between two entities of your interest, uh, or like in this example, like uh, a protein and uh, a phenotype. So Signor offer a wide range of logic relationship that can be managed and arranged by expert to, to assemble an ad hoc prior knowledge network. And uh, he has a valuable coverage. We have over 24,000 uh, inter causal interaction. It can be used to map uh, phosphoproteomic data. And we also collect pathways that um, can be viewed in the index uh, archive. Um, this is to, to give you an example of how Signor can be useful to, for example, predict uh, um, the cellular behavior during, for example, a physiological or pathological condition. This is a work that has been done by a colleague of mine, Francesca Sacco, that uh, is in our group. She's working on uh, acute myeloid leukemia that is a very complex heterogeneous disease, uh, very often um, caused by co-occurrence of uh, driver mutation. And uh, what, she, what she did was to apply uh, a strategy that integrates uh, a little to drive network um, built in Signor with uh, genomic data coming from patients so to, to, to the end to infer a possible clinical outcome or personalized treatment. So what we did, we built this, uh, this network describing the molecular uh, mechanism that, uh, that uh, involve uh, the um, AML driver genes uh, and uh, the hallmark uh, cancer, I mean the cancer hallmark um, phenotypes. And uh, of course, uh, this, um, this kind of uh, network then can be very, uh, can be used to build uh, a Boolean network, a Boolean map that allow you to, to run a simulation, uh, for example, uh, upon different uh, input conditions. And, uh, and then I would like to show you here uh, what we have done in Signor for, uh, um, um, uh, we annotate causal relationship that are relevant for COVID-19 pathology to generate a SARS-CoV-2 signaling network senior. We use different strategy. First of all, as already Marek said, we inside the COVID-19 disease uh, map project, we annotate uh, cellular pathway that has been result modulated during SARS-CoV-2 infection. I have to say that actually most of our, our interaction are coming from uh, SARS, uh, um, SARS data since there are only few uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, molecular uh, data available. And then we annotate also inside the senior network uh, all the missing protein that resulted modulated during SARS-CoV-2 infection, especially in the interactome experiment, uh, for example, the Krogan, uh, Krogan paper or Lee paper or Sukalov paper. And also we annotate uh, uh, the interaction between COVID-19 effective drugs and their cellular targets. The, this is the resulting uh, COVID causal network. And uh, here you can see is like uh, um, the list of our COVID modulated pathways. And uh, there is like attachment and entry, inflammation response, fibrosis and so on. For example, if you click to one of these uh, uh, this pathway, this is how it looked like inside the senior home page where you have all the different nodes connected either by direct or indirect interaction. The yellow dots are the viral protein while the green are the, the cellular, human cellular uh, protein, and then we can also annotate stimulus or, for example, phenotypes. What is, uh, uh, I think, uh, interesting that uh, this uh, network, uh, this pathway then can be uh, further um, integrated to, with other data. For example, you can ask uh, a search for the, which are the first neighborhood, I mean, which are the, the protein that, uh, the first uh, neighborhood they interact with these uh, nodes. Or you can see how this uh, pathway in, I mean, is connected with all senior data sets. 
or you can even check how the, the network is uh, integrated with the protein protein interaction coming from IMEX resources. This, uh, I mean, uh, this work, uh, I think is. Yeah, it's just the last slide. So I think, uh, um, I mean, uh, this kind of, of, uh, of network uh, is, uh, can allow us to, to, to integrate, I mean, uh, to, to, to see uh, which is the signaling pathway that are modulated during the infection, also because it can be integrated, as also already in Marek said before, here, for example, inside the COVID disease map, but you can, for, for example, you can see how this network uh, uh, interact with all, for example, the senior causal network, you can uh, integrate interactomic data or proteomic data, or for example, transcriptomic data. Of course, uh, by this kind of study, it could be possible, for example, to highlight uh, some uh, pathway or some uh, biological process that uh, are modulated during the, 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 co the COVID-19 infection. Moreover, for example, you can filter the, the, the resulting network by, for example, only um, keeping that nodes that has been shown modulated during, for example, in the transcriptomic experiment or transcriptomic or proteomic experiment. So then I would like to thank uh, all my group, uh, the senior and main team, particularly Marta Iannuccelli that has uh, curated most of the pathway, uh, the COVID modulated pathway and uh, our um, PIs Gianni and uh, Luisa and also for my member Lydia Perfetto is uh, collaborating uh, still with us. And uh, since I mean, we, I didn't have time to, to show you I mean, the functionality of Signor uh, or uh, the sister database or even uh, uh, Mint uh, or IMEX, please contact me for uh, more detailed uh, description or you can also contact the Intact Desk for the IMEX data set. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Luana. There are several questions here that I'm going to read for you. So apart from activation inhibition interactions, is it possible to use Signal for inferring Boolean rules or functions of the dynamics uh, of the regulatory interactions? If not, how to infer these uh, functions then? Yes, and uh, the example that I show you about the AML, the amyloid, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, I mean, what uh, we did, I mean, we built a network and then we uh, did a Boolean uh, approach, I mean, Boolean simulation to see how depending uh, which are the driver gene that are mutated, how we expect uh, uh, will be modulated the network, the cellular network. Uh, so yes, it's absolutely can be used for, uh, used for this kind of uh, analysis. And we, we already use for this kind of analysis. Yes, uh, does Sinor exports to biopacks or something else? It's from me. No. It's possible, I mean, we have uh, SBML, uh, pos uh, it's possible to export as a SBM file. And uh, we have also the, the causal tab that is uh, this uh, PSI MI tabular format that allow to, I mean, it's been expanded in order to also have information about uh, causal interaction. I have a question with respect to COVID. Uh, so Signal is a huge uh, repository and uh, the pathways are rather generic. How to make them more specific to COVID, kind of reusing what it already has been built and not uh, uh, again building pathways which are also participating in COVID. So in, in a way, how to COVIDize pathways? So, I mean, what was our main problem while building the modulated pathway, COVID modulated pathway in Signor is that uh, we annotate uh, uh, interaction that, uh, I mean, in the paper that specifically say, for example, that uh, S protein, uh, the S uh, cov 2 protein uh, up regulates or down regulates another protein or, uh, for example, a, a phenotype. And what was the main problem that is most of the data in the literature is uh, very generic, doesn't give really this uh, specific de definition description. I'm sure all of, all, many of you that have curated this data see that, uh, for example, very often it's just that they infect with the virus the cell and they say that uh, the MAP kinase uh, 
are, are upregulated or, for example, is just uh, is involved in the apoptosis pathway. So in this sense, so it's uh, a result like poor because uh, in the way we curate it, we cannot uh, add, I mean, add information that are not very, very specific, very, very well described at, at the molecular level. And also, for example, it come out a very large, I mean, you know, very large interactome data were coming from, uh, as I say, from Krogam and others. What we have tried to do is to uh, connect in senior the protein of this interactome. But for example, we cannot connect uh, this protein with the SARS protein because we only know that these two protein binds, but which is the fact is unknown. So... We prefer yeah. to keep to put less things but correct instead of. <laughs> yeah, this is a good approach. So I'll let you to answer other questions if they are coming uh, by text. Okay. Uh, and now uh, I transfer the lead uh, to Emmanuel, who will continue chairing this uh, workshop. Please. Oh, hello to everyone. Can you hear me? Wow. So the next speaker is Carlos Vega from Luxembourg University. Do you want to switch on maybe your video? Yes. My computer. So uh, we have uh, encountered here a problem with the sound. So I uh, will continue and we will solve it a yeah. bit later. Um, uh, so we invite uh, Carlos Vega, actually it's going to be a recorded uh, question and Carlos will answer to, to your questions. Um. <clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is Carlos Vega. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Bioinformatics Corps in the Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine. I will present to you BioKC, platform for quality control curation and annotation of synthesis biology models. Biomedical knowledge curation is a laborious manual process aggravated by the ever-increasing growth of biomedical literature. Currently, high-quality curation efforts concentrate around dedicated pathway databases with a limited input from the research community. We need curators to filter out noise from signal and highlight the most relevant pieces of knowledge. There is a need for novel collaborative tools and platforms allowing to improve the quality and the output of the creation process. In this sense, the traditional approach is limited since creation starts in diagram editors which do not provide collaborative features for community work. This limits the review process and the speed to communicate work. Also, it's often preferable to first work on the model components, its annotations, and supporting evidence, and once a model is mature, it makes sense to work on the visualization. Moreover, the same model could be visualized in different ways, which motivates separating the model from the visualization. We took a look at similar tools from the biomedical field as well as general text annotation tools and compared some of the features. General text annotation tools have many interesting features. Many of them provide collaborative features that can work with SBML since they are not oriented to the biomedical field. Still, biomedical annotation tools do not support SBML format and don't provide collaborative features. Collaboration is crucial to create complex interactions and annotate them with literature, creating trusted models, reviewed and double checked by a group of researchers. Only diagram and visualization tools support SPML. There is a clear interoperability gap 
between visual tools and annotation creation tools. Therefore, we aim to decouple the layout editing from the model creation, but also fill this gap so that tools can interoperate. For that, we developed BioKC, which allows for the creation of facts encoded in SVNL. We built BioKC on top of our text mining pipeline called BioKB. A fact is a piece of knowledge encoded in SVNL that we want to direct the user to create granular facts, clearly delimited and hence more reusable. But this is always at discretion of the user, of course. For the annotation of evidence, we allow the user to pick sentences from the results of our text mining pipeline by OKB, but also to import annotated sentences from third party sources. On top of that, BioKC has collaborative features, including tasks or comments, which help organizing and reviewing the creation process. BioKC works with groups of facts, and we use a group level role system similar to GitLab or GitHub systems. Therefore, users can be members of multiple groups and have different roles on them. We offer the user two complementary workflows to start creating facts. First workflow allows the user to gather evidence and then create a model from it. Here you can see a basket. And as we were soaking sentences, we can include sentences found in BioKB into our basket for later use. In this case, BioKC integrates with BioKV interface, adding new features when you are registered into the system. We can also add these sentences from a file for now, we support TSB files, but we plan to improve the interoperability as we engage into more collaborations with other research teams. Once we have finished gathering sentences, we can check out and start building the components of our model. For example, we can start adding species from the evidence that we collected. We can add compartments and reactions. These are elements available in the SVML data model. We can also assign ontology terms from identifiers.org. You can start building a fact, adding species, compartment, or reactions, and later on assign sentences to the model. Once we are finished, we can decide the group of our fact. For example, we could have a group of facts dedicated to COVID-19. Once a fact is saved, we will be able to edit it in the fact view. Here we can see how easy it is to drag and drop sentences from the menu to the fact that we are created. It's precisely in this fact view where the second workflow starts. In this view, we can either edit our previously created facts or we can start a new one. Here we can edit the components of the model and add more of them. We have two modes of operation, creation mode and annotation mode. Creation mode allows us to edit the components of the fact. Annotation mode allows us to assign evidence from BioKB or other sources. Here we can see how an, an species was added to the fact. On the annotation mode, we can pick up sentences from BioKB and assign these sentences to one or multiple parts of our model. Notice how BioKV changes the user interface when we are in annotation mode, adding a menu to assign a sentence to different parts of our model. We can also do this with third party sentences, of course. Once a fact reaches certain maturity, we will be able to release a version of it, which will be locked in time, but will we will be able to release further versions of it with new identifiers. We are working to provide a stable identifiers so that these facts can be later on referenced in other tools. Of course, facts can be exported to SVNL and we aim to improve the interoperability with other tools such as Cell Designer and Minerva. We strongly believe that BioKC could improve model quality and speed up the creation process. Thank you very much for your time and please Register and, and feel free to share your thoughts with us. If there are any questions. Thanks, Carlos. Now 
please switch on your camera and you will be able to answer questions. Uh, people are a bit sleepy, they did not ask any questions meanwhile. So I am uh, wondering how specific uh, this wonderful, uh, very simple uh, um, system can be, for example, for particular disease. So in terms of COVID or, for example, cancer, uh, other searches can be very specific to a particular uh, disorder. The, the advantage of BioKV is that we can look up for interactions between uh, entities. So we are able to, we, our text mining pipeline is able to identify not only entities in the publications at sentence level, but also uh, the directionality of them. Like if, if it's increased or decreased or correlated with. Uh, but also we, in BioKC, what we do is we use the results from BioKV text mining pipeline, but we are also able to use third party uh, annotations from, from other sources. So the main idea is that we are uh, providing an interface build uh, facts in SVML model. So they are very easy to export um, in SVML and use it in other tools. Thanks. I hope it will become part of uh, disease maps as an interesting part. Thanks a lot. If there are questions, uh, you can continue typing sure. the answer. And now we will listen to the talk of uh, Vidisha Sain from University of Ivry uh, in France. Hello everyone, I'm Vidisha Singh, PhD student, and today I will be going to present you RMAP, which is a state-of-art interactive knowledge base for the disease rheumatoid arthritis. So just a brief introduction about molecular interaction maps. These are the representations of biological processes, disease mechanisms that are both human and machine readable. These are high quality source of knowledge, including signaling pathways, gene expression, cellular phenotypes that could act as a template for data visualization. They can also be seen and analyzed as a complex network to study the topology and the structure. And most importantly, they can also serve as a scaffold for a mathematical model. All the cellular processes, interactions, and biological networks could be described in a standard graphical language with SPGN, which is systems biology graphical notation. Here are the three main SPGN language, namely process description, activity flow, and entity relationship that shows different granularity of the different biological processes depicted. RMAP is a process description map that shows the mechanistic details of the biological processes. We are working with the disease rheumatoid arthritis, which is a complex autoimmune disease. It's an autoimmune disease that causes chronic inflammation of the joint, in which the immune system of the body mistakenly attacks the synovial lining surrounding the joint, leading to an inflammatory response. This response thickens the synovium, causing infiltration of various cells inside the synovium and causing the destruction of the cartilage and bone. Rheumatoid arthritis involves a very complex interplay between the different cell types of that of the innate immune system and adaptive immune system like macrophages, T cells, B cells, among others, to that of the cells of the joints like fibroblasts, chondrocytes and osteoclasts that lead to the production of metalloproteinases and other molecules that eventually lead to the erosion of bones and cartilage destruction. Here I present you the RA map. We use the software cell designer to construct the map. This map is SPGN compliant that I mentioned before. It has 506 species and 449 reactions. We have used 353 scientific publications for the construction of this map. All the molecular signature, including the significant signaling pathways, gene expression and cellular phenotypes are expert validated. We have detailed annotation for each and every component and interaction present in the map, with every component supported by at least two studies. RMAP is structured in a form of compartments where you have the flow information starting from extracellular space. Here we have the lichens, 
These ligands, they're assembled with the receptors in the plasma membrane to form receptor ligand complex. These complex initiate and activate different signaling cascades in the cytoplasm. These, these signaling pathways activate different transcription factors and these transcription factors, they're transported to the nucleus where they regulate certain gene expression. We also have secreted component compartment and cellular phenotype compartment. All the manual curation of the literature related to the disease and the data storage is done in the medium part of the cell designer, which is the minimal information required in the annotation of models. It facilitates the interoperability and map reusability with consistent annotation and curation in the computational models. Here is the RMAP content. The main signaling pathways covered in the RMAP are JEXTED pathway, NF-kappa B pathway, PI3K, AKT pathway, MPK pathway, and the cellular phenotypes involved are inflammation, matrix degradation, osteoclastrogenesis, bone erosion, angiogenesis, among others. RMAP is a global map that consists of different cell types like synovial fibroblast, synovial tissue, peripheral blood mononucleus cell among others. Here we categorize the information about different cell tissue and fluid sources in the RMAP, where 45% of the RMAP components come from the source synovial fibroblast, followed by 35% of the RMAP components belonging to synovial tissue. RMAP is available in a form of a Google map using the platform Minerva, which is molecular interaction network visualization that provide access to all the information used and annotation with easy navigation. Any component of interest could be searched on the left panel in the search column and its corresponding position on the map will be shown in the form of bubbles. Further clicking on the bubbles could give information about interacting drugs, chemicals and microRNAs. On the left panel, you can also provide, you can also access the information provided during the construction of the map for the particular component. Here we have the PubMed references for interleukin-6. In Minerva, user-defined overlays could be provided to visualize their enrichment on the corresponding map. For example, here we can visualize the signable fibroblast submap on the global RA map. In this slide, we selected the signable tissue overlay in addition, and you can differentiate between these two overlays with the user-provided color code. Map could also be used to visualize enrichment of different data sets. For example, here we provided a transcriptomic data sets from Wurzel et al. as an overlay. RMAP is published and can be reached at rmap.lxl-luxembourg.org. We also perform clustering and functional analysis of the RM network. Clustering of the network was done by using GLA algorithm. Functional analysis of the cluster were done with David for disease and pathway enrichment. Here you can see the path RMAP and here you can see the clustered mo modules. Here are uh, the pathway and disease enrichment of the top five modules. Enrich pathways like TNF, osteoplast differentiation, and f kappa b toll like receptor are also significant pathways in the disease rheumatoid arthritis. For the disease enrichment, it not only shows the enrichment in RA, but also in type 2 diabetes, with which the risk of rheumatoid arthritis has already been established. This enrichment reveals comorbidities, some parts common in different disease. Here are the conclusion. We have presented you a state-of-art knowledge-based interactive map for RA, which is expert validated for various signaling pathways, gene expression, and cellular phenotypes. It can also be used as a template for data visualization. It is system biology graphical notation compliant. It could also be analyzed as a network and also serve as a base for the construction of a mathematical I would like to thank each and every member of the team for their invaluable help and support. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Vidisha. Please. Thank you. Are you here already? Yes. Yes. Uh, so I don't see too many questions there. I have a, a, a question. Uh, like us, you build the network uh, using manual curation. So you really yes. research it, you compose it in cell designer. So, uh, um, of course, uh, knowledge grows, and there are also. Uh, well, omics databases and data sets that coming out that would enrich maybe with some information the network. So how to combine this information together? And also how to uh, reliable are those informations that would come from networks inferred from uh, 
uh, data and add it into your uh, knowledge uh, uh, curated network. In yeah, the data sets, we use overlays in Minerva to see how much overlap we have, we have with the network. In order to integrate the data, um, obviously, uh, we need to go through uh, the expert validation for the data and also uh, regarding the pathways in the map that you want to address. And, um, and I, I, I couldn't understand your second question. I could understand the question about OMIC data set. What about the um, confidence uh, of the data which is added from uh, OMIC uh, studies? Because we know that the manual curated data is highly confident. Yeah, that is and true. Yes, and uh, well, how would you then uh, consider the uh, information coming from the OMIC uh, integrated into your knowledge curated? Well, um, this. I cannot think of anything right now. How can we validate it? For example, for the manual creation of every component or all the data sets, we usually take help from the from the um, from uh, from our rheumatologist for all the pathways and how important it is and if the molecules are important in the pathways to be added or not. So for the omic data, in order to find the confidence for the omic data set, I cannot think anything right now. But I will go through your question and I will get back to you for sure. Thank you. Okay. Isha, look at the questions if they are coming. Uh, okay. Now. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Now we'll um, listen to the talk of uh, Cristobal. Cristobal is, um, is there um, to answer the questions. Good afternoon, my name is Cristobal Monraz from Astrid Curie, and today I'm going to present to you our work on the regulated cell death map. Cell death mechanisms have been widely studied due to their implication in many diseases. Cells can either die from regulated cell death or succumb to accidental cell death. In this work, we focused on the regulated cell death that encompasses different signaling pathways that lead to cell destruction. This work is a part of a research that has been developed at Curie, the Atlas of Cancer Signaling Network, that contains different maps of different biological processes that are relevant for cancer. During the first release of this research, the only cell death mode described was apoptosis. Then it evolved to regulated cell death that covers more pathways. These maps are done in order to generate an organized resource that contains formalized biological results from many research groups in the form of papers. Also to provide a platform to share information and to open discussion within the community. Lastly, to create an analytical tool to integrate different types of data, but also for network modeling. The map was constructed in the following way. First, the literature curation step, where we took many papers and sources of biological information that describe different processes of regulated cell death. Then, we used the cell designer software in order to construct a network and map, and following the system's biology graphical notation. The map is a reaction network represented using process diagram description graphical language. Then, the map was uploaded to the Navisol platform in order to allow its navigation. The RCD map has a hierarchical structure. First, we have the layers, initiation, signaling, and execution. Underneath them, we have the zones, like metabolism, stress response, and ligand receptor. And underneath, we have the functional modules that are the description of the different pathways of regulated cell death. This is the view of the map on the Navisol web platform that is powered by Google Maps. This includes the map window, a selection panel, a data integration and analysis panel, and an upper panel. Elements such as the zooming bars or markers or colored windows are part of the Google Maps engine. Querying the map is possible via the search window 
or just by checking on the entity in the list of entities in the selection panel. This will drop a marker onto the map depending where is the entity located. For instance, in here in this picture, we have cast base nine. And then if you zoom in inside the map, you will see the different species and reactions that are part of the map. And if you click onto any species in this map, you will see a dialogue that displays all the information about the entity annotations and where is in the map. And now I will present to you some applications of the map using that. We have used our maps for different purposes. We have compared Alzheimer disease to lung cancer to see the different regulatory cell death mechanisms. These two diseases have been described to have an inverse comorbidity that is a lower than expected co-occurrence between both diseases. For this analysis, we use the Roma method to quantify the activity per module in the map. This method gives a score based on the largest amount of one-dimensional variance across the samples by the genes in the module. Then we use the map staining technique to visualize the scores from the Roma analysis. The map staining technique uses the background of the map to visualize the values mapped onto individual molecular entities or group of entities. In this case, the different modules in the map. In this study, we observed an inverse activity between both diseases, mainly regarding their metabolic modules. But in Alzheimer cases, we saw a trend for an activation of paroptosis, whereas in the lung cancer cases, we saw a higher activation in modules such as endoplasmic reticulum stress. Then by mapping the scores onto the map, we see an activation of the paroptosis module rather than other modules in Alzheimer disease cases. And paroptosis has been described as a caspase one dependent response to chronic aseptic inflammation. And in our study, we took the top contributing genes in this module, pyroptosis, and by checking them in the literature, we could see that many of these genes are involved in different parts of the Alzheimer pathology, but also in this chronic neural inflammation. Whereas in the lung cancer, the staining shows a higher activity in the downstream modules, but not in the initiation modules. The most striking case was the endoplasmic reticulum stress module, which uh, has been related to treatment resistance. In the list of top contributing genes, we found two genes that had been related to be overexpressed in patients resistant to cisplatin, whereas also there are some genes that are participating in the crosslink with the nf kappa -B pathway and other genes that don't have consistent reports to lung cancer and and the plasmic reticulum stress. Then we decided to compare different subtypes of ovarian cancer regarding regulated solid programs by using a data set that has been previously subtyped using a negative matrix factorization approach. Using these definitions of groups, we apply the Roma approach in this data. The visualization of the Roma scores in the context of this map have revealed some differences among the four groups. For instance, the differentiated subtype had a higher activation of the metabolic modules regarding mitochondria, whereas the immunoreactive had a higher activity in ligand receptor related modules. The mesenchymal type that has been described to be the most aggressive one has a lower activity of metabolic modules related to mitochondrial function whereas the proliferative subtype had a higher activity in modules that are related to anabolic activities such as fatty acid biosynthesis, but also in DNA damage response. Then we plotted some copy number data, the blue red triangles you can see there, and we saw that the proliferative subtype had a higher number of copy numbers in average than in other subtypes. To conclude, this map is a robust tool that allows exploring the mechanisms leading to regulated cell death. This map has been already published and it's available in different platforms.
Finally, I would like to thank all the people that has been under this work and also my team at Institute Curie and you for your attention. This is everything for me and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, uh, Cristobal. Can you switch on your video? Hi. For the questions. Yes. Hi. Um, uh, so the question is about uh, well, regulated solar has a very generic um, process. Uh, this mark became part of, uh, of COVID-19. Can you describe a bit how you did it more specific to COVID and what parts were taken and which ones were not? Uh, well, our contribution for the COVID-19 map was about uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress. And this map has, has been constructed with uh, canonical pathways. So the activation of certain proteins that happen uh, or are critical in this response were only, mm, well, were checked in the literature for other uh, coronavirus uh, infections that have been more studied that belong to the same family. And then uh, we preserved uh, everything that was overlapping with it. Okay, there is another question here. Can you suggest a method to calculate the molecules within a given map from data and structure? It's a very generic question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well. No, it, it was from me. It was about the modules in the, in the map because they are, they are defined based on the structure of the map. And uh, for any other map, they might be different. So could you suggest a method or approach how to automatize their calculation? Mm, okay. Well, actually, these uh, module definitions have been uh, done manually. Uh, we haven't uh, done it uh, like a calculation or something. It was more about uh, what we found in literature and uh, were defined based on that. So, um, yeah. Actually, I I don't know if uh, <clears throat> if there could be a method to to do so that it's uh, automatic for it. But if you know something, let me know. Right. Uh, so manual curation finally is the best uh, solution, as we understand from many presenters today. So thank you, Cristobal. Uh, if you. there are more questions, you can try, type the answers. So now I'm going to listen to the talk of uh, Carlos uh, from uh, Barcelona Supercomputing. Uh, excuse me. We're going to listen to uh, Davide uh, from Barcelona Supercomputing from Spain. Sorry. Hello, and thank you for attending this presentation on multilayer networks and the dynamics of their community structure. Let's start from laying some basic foundations. A multilayer network is something that we can define as a network of networks, which are called layers, and display specific intralayer edges connecting their nodes. It is important to note already at this point that by collecting several networks in this way and not merging them, we preserve the topology of each layer, which is particularly important, especially for biological networks. Beside the intralayer edges, a multilayer network has interlayer edges, which connect nodes among different layers. If the connected nodes are exactly the same, for instance, the same gene in different layers, these edges are called coupling edges. And in all the examples that I show you in this presentation, uh, we will use multilayer networks with coupling edges. Once you connect all the, the uh, other nodes in this way, you can see that some nodes can be present only in certain layers and not in others. This is actually a strength of this graph-based framework, especially when it is used for the integration of data from heterogeneous sources of biomedical information, which, as you know, can be sparse and incomplete but useful to study cases in which, on the contrary, we have little but highly curated information like rare diseases. 
Once we have a multi-layer network like this in our hands, what we can do is to detect communities, which is a common practice in network biology to infer strong associations among bioentities. Although there is not a definitive definition for communities in networks, it is widely accepted to consider a community the group of nodes that are more densely connected with each other than the rest of the network. A measure of this property is called modularity, Q, which is a quality function of a partition C of the network X that we thus can maximize in order to identify communities. In the case of a multilayer network, we maximize the sum of the modularities of each layer G. As you can see, the modularity is parameterized also to a parameter gamma that is called the modularity resolution. The higher the resolution, the smaller the size of the detected communities. In the graph on the right hand side, you can see this inverse correlation between the community size and the number of communities as the resolution increases. Indeed, if you systematically increase the resolution, you can observe a progressive fragmentation of the detected communities, or in other words, the coexistence of multiple community structures at different scales, something that is actually called the limit of the modularity resolution. Nevertheless, certain nodes stay always together regarding of the resolution value, which for us is a strong indication that those nodes are tightly associated. This observation is even more relevant considering the multiple evidence of associations from the multilayer network and also considering that those nodes stay together even in the initial range of resolution where, as you can see, the most dramatic changes in the community structure occur. So we apply this idea of identifying modules of nodes that always stay together in this range of resolution to rare diseases. In a collaborative effort, in the context of projects like RD Connect and Neuromics, we perform an in-depth genomic analysis of a small cohort of patients affected by congenital myasthenic syndrome. All those patients have the exact same causal mutation in the receptor for acetylcholine, but they display different levels of severity. Since neither specific classes of mutation nor demographic or clinical data segregate with patient severity, we sought to explore the hypothesis supported by experts that disease severity is due to potentially damaging variants in patient-specific critical elements. So using a multilayer network generated from databases of protein-protein interaction, metabolic reactions and pathways, we identified modules of genes that actually discriminate the severe and non-severe groups and that contain genes that are altered in distinct patients. For instance, in the middle of this slide, you have a module that is private to the, to the severe cases. All those genes are functionally related based on the evidence from multilayer network and are altered in a patient-specific manner. For instance, one patient has compound heterozygous variants in the gene agrin, which is known uh, to be involved in congenital myasthenic syndrome, and which affects the clustering of the acetyl acetylcholine receptor. Another patient has variants in laminins and tenosins, which are structural elements of the extracellular matrix in the synaptic cleft of the neuromuscular junction. In the same way, we characterize as well the non-severe cases. Besides looking uh, uh, for nodes that always stay together in the same communities, in other projects we also study the trajectories of uh, the communities visited by each gene at different scales. To do so, we first label all the communities, we then compare all the trajectories and compute a distance matrix that we can use to generate a tree to visualize how those genes distribute in the communities while they form and vanish. We can use this tree to derive some features to be used for several analytical tasks. Features such as the distance of the communities in the tree um, and their composition in terms of specific genes of interest. We use this approach in collaboration with the Curie Institute to perform a dimensionality reduction in the number of genes that in a previous publication using proteogenomic data were found to characterize the four known subgroups of meduloblastoma, which is a pediatric brain tumor. We generated a large multilayer network using databases of protein interaction, drug targets and much more, and we computed the multilayer community trajectories of each genes in these datasets. We then use this information to find the minimal number of genes that were able to accurately recapitulate the patient stratification, achieving an accuracy of 95% with a dimensionality reduction of 87%. 
the beauty of this approach is not only that we now have a more manageable set of genes to study medulloblastoma, but also that we can characterize their associations in the multilayer network communities to which they belong in the first place. And this is actually what we did in this work, discovering that some groups are enriched in certain pathways, others in specific variants and drug targets, etc. To conclude, multilayer networks represent a powerful tool for heterogeneous data integration in rare diseases. The study of multilayer community structure at different scales enables to detect strong associations between bioentities. The identification of genes that consistently be belong to the same communities facilitates functional analysis. And the study of multilayer community trajectories allows to accurately perform tasks such as dimensionality reduction and molecular interpretation. I would like to acknowledge uh, all the collaborators that took part in this project, which are probably much more than those listed here. I particularly thank the Computational Biology Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and in particular the group leader, Alfonso Valencia. And a big thank to Iker Nunez, who is the PhD student that is behind all this work and who perform all the computational analysis and the interpretation of the results. And I finally thank the European project Individualized Pediatric Cure for the support. And thank you for your attention. I will be happy to uh, answer your question. Thanks, Davide. Uh, we would like to see you. Here I am. You are here. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions. Um, uh, so how would you apply this approach for disease where the disease uh, does not have uh, prominent multiomics, as Huntington, epilepsies, and others rare diseases, for example? Yeah. Thank you. It's an interesting question, actually. Um, we built a gene-gene multilayer network, so all the, all the entities that you find in these multilayer networks are uh, genes. But you actually can build a multilayer network using uh, uh, whatever kind of representation you want, uh, depending on the data that you have. So, for instance, in the case of the epilepsy or other type of uh, diseases of interest for which you don't have a molecular profile, um, you can use uh, a patient multilayer network, for instance, or you can use uh, some other kind of, uh, of information. This can also be built in a way with uh, um, heterogeneous entities, uh, something like the knowledge graph that we saw at the beginning of, uh, of this session. You are very popular. There are many questions. I'm reading another one. So an interesting approach to questions. How have uh, you solved the, the modularity plot problem? And then I will read the second one. Okay. So, uh, yes. Um, yes. The first question is, how have you solved the modularity plot problem? Yes. Uh, so as you... Um, so basically, yes, after a certain uh, uh, value of, uh, uh, of resolution, uh, uh, you can see that we reach a plateau in, the, in this uh, fragmentation of communities. So a plateau essentially of the function that describe uh, the dependency between the number of, uh, uh, of communities that you are finding and, uh, and their uh, size. So um, we actually focus uh, on the first uh, part of this, uh, of this process. Uh, we define these regions in, a, in, a, in an automatic way using uh, an analysis of the derivative of this function. But anyways, the, 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 more, the more interesting, let's say, part is actually right before the plateau is reached, so in uh, all these uh, initial um, stages, because there you have the most dramatic changes. So uh, when you start uh, like uh, systematically changing this resolution uh, parameter, you see that things like the, the, you have a lot of changes in the, in the composition and size of the communities, and then you reach a plateau. So we, in all those work, we essentially like identify the region of interest that is initial one, and then focus on, on this one. Okay, it was an extensive answer. Therefore, I won't read the next question. The questions are coming and coming. Please text uh, the answers. Thank you very much. We Thank switch you. to the next presentation um, uh, by Martina from Maastricht University in the Netherlands. It will be again a recorded talk. Martina is here to answer your questions. Um, Good afternoon. My name is Martina Sumakutmon, and I'm an assistant professor at Maastricht University. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present some of the ongoing developments in the Wikipassers project. 
As one of the Wikipasses architects, I would like to start with an acknowledgement page, because there are so many people involved in the project and the work I present today. Together with Alex Pico from the Gladstone Institute, we are leading a team of core developers and admin curators, but a lot of the content and features come from contributors and password curators around the world. Wikipasses itself and all associated tools are developed under an open source license and available on GitHub. I'll start with a short introduction of what Wikipasses is. Wikipasses was launched in 2008 as an experiment in community-based curation of biological pathways. Already back then, there were simply too many publications that it was difficult to keep knowledge up to date, accessible and integrated. This is even more true nowadays. So building on the idea of crowdsourcing, we want to take advantage of the direct participation of expert research communities. Wikipass is built on the same software as Wikipedia and focuses on collecting and curating knowledge about biological passwords. The database is, is community curated and everybody can contribute, edit, and use the password content. This provides a platform where new findings can be added immediately, ideally by the experts themselves. Discussions about content are encouraged and version history allows easy reversions to a previous older version if needed. We have successful collaborations with other manual curated pathway databases like Reactum or NetPath to provide direct feedback from the community. Using the concept of quality tags, annotations, which give information about the curation status of a pathway, we allow users to share and collaborate on pathways still under development, which will not be included in downloadable collections for now. It is also possible to keep pathway passwords private for a specific time frame and only share it with specific users. Using ontology tags from the disease and cell type ontology, we encourage users to upload disease and cell type specific password. On Wikipasses itself, every password has its own password page with the title, author list and a clickable diagram. Each element is annotated with an identifier. And if you click on the element, cross-references to other databases are provided by BridgeDB. Additionally, you can also find the mentioned quality and ontology tags on the password page, providing insights in the curation status and the biological context of the password model. In the password, each element, notes and interactions can be annotated with publication references, and a bibliography is provided. As mentioned before, a wiki system keeps record of all revisions of a password, and previous versions and differences can be checked and assessed here. Every password also has a discussion page, and the password can be downloaded in different formats, from machine-readable formats for analysis to different types of image formats. Additionally, to the largest BC-specific password collections, we also enable communities to create and maintain their own focused collections of interest on so-called community portals. We currently have over 15 portals for different communities on Wikipathway, from the plant portal to rare diseases to COVID-19. In the COVID-19 disease map project, we collaborate with a large group of international researchers, curators and modelers to build a curated collection of COVID-19 related password models. Our COVID-19 portal is part of that initiative, and we recently received a grant from a Dutch funding organization to further improve the content and develop relevant new software features, including better support for multi-species pathways and annotation of evidence level. I will now shortly talk about the current content and coverage of Wikipathway. Wikipathway contains close to 3,000 pathways for 25 different species. The focus is still very much on human pathways at this point. We have a monthly release cycle and additional statistics can be found on the website. Pathways can be downloaded individually or in collections. The native format of Wikipathways is GPML, the graphical pathway markup language. Additionally, you can download the pathways in image formats, gene lists and biopacks formats. There are several different ways on how Wikipathways data can be accessed programmatically. We have a REST API, and our data is available in RDF format through our Sparkle endpoint. 
Additionally, we have different packages and apps for access from R and Cyberscape. Our human password collection is also accessible from Index and Wikidata. In 2020, we have about 15 to 20,000 visitors every month and over 500,000 REST web service calls. A while back, we investigated the current coverage of protein coding genes in common password databases. This shows that there are still 40% of protein coding genes which are not present in any database. There are only very few non-coding proteins covered and many protein coding genes are only present in one database. So how can we reduce the number of genes that are not present in any of the passwords yet? This led to the, a new project. Uh, a lot of information is published in static password figures. And we wanted to see if we can extract gene information from those figures. In 2018, we did a short pilot study focused on 500 signaling password figures in PubMed Central. We found that for a large part of the password figures, we could indeed use approaches like optical character recognition to automatically extract gene information. So we decided to look at all the policy figures in the last 25 years. We used PubMed Central to look for figures linked to pathways, signaling passes, metabolic pathways, and so on. Obviously, not all of these figures were actual password figures. So we used machine learning to further classify the figures and reduce the set to about 64,000 actual password figures. Using OCR, we then identified the genes in the pathways and created gene sets which can be used to prioritize password creation and to perform enrichment analysis. We also provide a simple user interface to query this large corpus of password figure information on our R Shiny website. Now in this last section, I shortly want to highlight a couple of analysis examples of how passwords can be visualized in networks and how they can be used for network analysis. First, I want to highlight the Wiki Passwords app inside this case. that can show the password as a diagram, similar as in Passvisio, ideal for data visualization. Additionally, you can open the password in network view, which removes the graphical annotations and only looks at the interactions between the elements ideal for network analysis approaches. With the Site Target Linker app, you can extend gene-focused networks with password information and create gene password association networks. As an example, together with Ilona, a PhD student at Maastricht University, we studied the password overlap and connections to study the molecular pathogenesis in primary open angle glaucoma by visualizing the password enrichment results as a gene password association network. In Ryan's project, we combined classical password enrichment analysis and visualization with active subnetwork analysis. We built a large combined network of all human pathways using the RDF and then identified subnetworks with similar expression patterns, ignoring the laboratory password boundaries. Wiki Pathways also contains many metabolic pathways, but metabolic data is still very sparse, so pathway enrichment is not very useful yet. Denise developed a method to find connected subnetworks of metabolic reactions that cross over pathway boundaries to connect all affected metabolites scattered in a different pathway. In summary, Wikipasis is a collaborative pathway database that supports open data and open source development. All data can be easily accessed on a website and programmatically. Pathway visualization can be done in Pathvisio and Cytoscape, and there are many different ways with how you can use pathway information from wiki pathways in network, network analysis approaches using the Cytoscape app, the RDF, Neo4j, or the Team Pathway Association networks. I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Martina. Yes, you're here. Uh, until we're waiting for others to uh, ask, uh, I'm using the opportunity uh, uh, that I'm chairman. So um, I know that in Wikipathis, uh, uh, there is no um, common layout or common design, and each pathway can be drawn in uh, creator-dependent mode. 
how do you solve uh, heterogeneity uh, problem? Yes, so um, in Wikipartis, we try to give um, quite some freedom in getting the initial diagrams in because we want to have a broad contribution from many, uh, uh, from many uh, experts. Um, in the RDF, we then do uh, infer certain semantics. So we have uh, MIM annotations uh, that can be used for interactions. We have the identifiers for the different elements. And so on the RDF level, uh, we start to really um, uh, basically unify the information that's in the pathways as much as possible. Um, Yes, uh, there are plugins for further standards that you can draw pathways in SPGN and things like that. Um, but in general, there is a very uh, low burden in the beginning to get started and get uh, information in already. Okay, meanwhile, there are several questions. Um, is it possible to download uh, WikiPathways database in simple TARF delimited file? Uh, with pathway plus gen gene information. Very so we, Yeah, we have an R package uh, that, uh, so we have the TMT files, which are pathway and then a list of genes in one row. Uh, but with the R wiki passes package, that's, uh, that's easily possible as well to convert into that format. If needed, I can provide uh, uh, the code for that as well. Okay, thanks. There are more questions. Please continue to type your answers. Thank you very much, Martina. Yeah. We now switch to the last uh, talk, which will be live talk uh, by uh, uh, Robin uh, Howe from Ontario Institute of uh, Cancer Research in Toronto, Canada. Um, so Robin, please share your screen with camera on and microphone on. And the stage is yours. I better unmute myself. That's great. Well, thank you, Irina. Yes. I'm just going to share my slides now. There we go. Okay, so hi, my name is Robin Ha. I work at the Ontario Institute for uh, Cancer Research in Toronto, Canada. And today I'll be talking about some new things going on with the React Home project. Um, now React Home is an open source, open access uh, pathway knowledge base capturing the human molecular events encompassing areas of metabolism, signaling, and other biological processes. Uh, the project dates back to about 2002 with Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and EBI. And now it's a four institution project with the YCR leading it with EBI, NYU and OHSU. Uh, essentially, we provide expert authored, manually curated and peer reviewed pathway modules that are traceable back to the primary literature. Much of our content uh, is extensively cross referenced to other external bioinformatic resources, not only to enrich our own annotations, but also to improve interoperability. And we've developed, I think, user-friendly, uh, biologist intuitive uh, software tools for uh, data visualization, integration, and analysis. Now, the central component uh, of our kind of pathway curation is the data model, uh, which is based upon the reaction. Uh, the nodes represent the biomolecules and the edges represent that conversion of one biomolecule or more into another via the reaction. And so biomolecules can certainly participate in multiple reactions. And we use a lot of uh, different reference databases to annotate the inputs, outputs, uh, cellular location, and the supporting evidence uh, to construct these reactions. Um, now, the flexibility of this model allows us to capture many different reaction types in Reactome. Uh, new to Reactome is the ability for us to capture drug target interactions. Uh, typically, the drugs that we are curating, they bind their target, and the resultant complex regulates the target reaction. So as a pilot study, uh, we focused on the annotation of uh, cardiovascular drugs, uh, things like anticoagulants, cardiac stimulants, antihypertensives, et cetera, to work out this curation process and to make sure that this process fits uh, with our data model. And our goal here is to curate about a thousand drugs. Now, reactions are then grouped into ordered causal chains to form pathways. Uh, the output of one reaction becomes the input for the, for the following reaction, or potentially it may be a catalyst for another. Um, one other thing I would like to mention is that there's a hierarchical organization of uh, reactome pathways. That is to say, uh, pathways can contain both uh, reactions, pathways, or potentially both. Um, and uh, pathways, in turn, can actually be organized uh, 
into kind of human recognizable biological events like uh, the cell cycle and intermediary metabolism. Now, biological processes are remarkably well conserved over large evolutionary distances. Uh, even though our focus is to annotate the molecular details of human biological events, we can use protein sequence orthology relationships uh, to ask whether the human proteins involved in a reaction have orthologs in another model organism. Now, if the orthologs exist in the panther resource, uh, we can computationally infer the corresponding reaction uh, for the model organism. And in this way, we kind of build up this predicted uh, pathway knowledge base for organisms. Um, and as of our recent uh, data release, we projected uh, our human proteins into almost 82,000 orthologs, creating over 18,000 orthologous pathways in 15 non-human species. Um, now, we also provide detailed uh, information on the altered pathways corresponding to human disease. Uh, we can annotate events where an infection introduces new proteins into the cell. Uh, the amount of a normal protein is changed, and this changes the function of the, the protein. Uh, a somatic or germline mutation changes the function of a protein. And as we've just already seen a few moments ago, the mode of action of drugs. And to date, uh, we've curated uh, over uh, 2,000 variant proteins and their involvement in, uh, in disease pathways. Now, one very topical area amenable for community curation is the annotation of the SARS uh, coronavirus viral host pathways. Uh, Marek and others earlier today have already talked about this. Um, the React Home team is uh, very happy to be participating in this large collaboration led by Marek at the Luxembourg Center for Systems Biology. And we're working with others, we're basically uh, assembling the parts list and the molecular events associated with the COVID-19 infections. Um, we have released the SARS coronavirus 1 infection pathway, and literally within the next few weeks, uh, we're planning to release additional COVID-19 related pathways. Um, and this COVID-19 related curation demonstrates a, uh, a, 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 an alternative community-based uh, curation approach. Uh, it's very much faster in terms of our traditional curation process, which takes a gold standard approach. That is to say, you know, previously it's been a centralized curation with external contributions. But with all that being said, um, we're always kind of in that, in that process of improving our manual curation practices with direct input from the research community. And I want to just take a few minutes just to kind of talk about the drivers of community annotation and react home. Um, successful community annotation needs incentives for contributors. Uh, we've implemented the ORCID ID system as a key mechanism for credit attribution. Uh, every accepted submission in Reactome is associated with an ORCID ID. And we can assign, uh, we can also assign digital object identifiers to the pathways. And these micro attributions are listed uh, in our table of contents and are associated with every pathway record that our domain experts contribute to. And we can also make uh, user biographical uh, pages uh, listing all of our contributors work available. Uh, now these works can also be synchronized with the ORCID page or a resume. And then obviously the final incentive really here is to try and publish uh, these contributions uh, in a peer reviewed journal. Now the main content delivery system available to our large and diverse user community is the Pathway Browser. Uh, you can search for and visualize pathway and reaction annotations in our pathway browser and through third-party uh, web resources that we use our data and tools. Uh, uh, Martina just talked about wiki pathways there, but there are many others that we use react on data. Uh, any external contributions are also accessible to us uh, so that our users can efficiently analyze and visualize their experimental data sets in the context of pathway data. And there's certainly a number of research papers citing the use of React Home uh, most of the time, which is quite encouraging. Uh, they're doing, these, these authors are using React Home in some form of data analysis. Our data is shareable and reusable. We provide open access uh, through our APIs. Uh, we have a number of partners that are reusing our software and are directing users uh, through web services to our data. There is also several data downloads available in different formats. Uh, which support data curation, visualization, integration, and analysis. Um, I, also, I mentioned earlier, Reactum is open source, open data. We are also an open graphics platform as well. 
Um, the website includes extensive documentation to help users understand our complete range of tools and for integrating our software. Our graphics, database files, and some of our specialized data formats are released as a Creative Commons CC BY license. And other annotation and mapping files, which essentially are in the public domain already, are released in CC0, where no attribution is required. Um, now, the Pathway Browser provides a framework uh, for data analysis and visualization of external data sets, uh, both uh, user-supplied experimental data and data provided by other on online resources. And the Pathway uh, overview here, and this shows the kind of visual interactive summary of the results of the Pathway analysis. A list of significant pathways is listed below the diagram. And as you drill down into specific pathways, you can see these uh, specific textbook illustrations uh, or pathway diagrams with the kind of experimental data overlays. And we can also provide uh, uh, a high level pathway overview visualization based on the Voronoi tessellations. And finally, uh, we can offer the opportunity to download the analysis results uh, as a single PDF file or another uh, or, uh, in other file formats. Um, now to support multi-omics data analysis, uh, we have a new React on GSA service that uses our uh, existing web interface and some novel R bioconductor package. Um, for uh, multi-omics gene set analysis, the React on GSA package supports the direct importation of data from the Expression Atlas, as well as uh, user uploaded data and offers three different types of uh, analysis methods. First being camera through the Lima package, ad hoc, and for a uh, single uh, sample gene set enrichment analysis, uh, we use the GSVA package as well. Now for single uh, cell RNA-seq pathway analysis, the Reactome GSA R package will support uh, the direct importation of data from the single cell expression atlas, as well as user supplied data. Um, the Reactum project also provides a suite of tools called the Reactum FI Biz app uh, for our users to perform uh, a single and multi omics uh, pathway and network based data analysis via the Cyberscape path platform. Uh, following a recent update, the functional interaction network now consists of 13,000 proteins and 436,000 interactions. Um, uh, some additional new features in the React and FOBIS app includes the ability now to provide support for uh, performing gene set enrichment analysis for React and pathways using a gene score file. Uh, we also provide new drug uh, interaction overlays onto pathway network visualizations. And we also provide a number of different types of pathway network modeling approaches to predict the pathway activities subject to a, a, a drug or a genetic perturbation. Um, uh, as some of you know, Python is becoming more and more popular in the data science in general and in bioinformatics in particular. And to support our own and other data analyses and visualization projects, we've developed a Python package by wrapping our APIs. Uh, that includes the analysis and content service APIs and the React and FI Viz app. Now uh, we've also developed the documentation and deployed the packages into several Python repositories, GitHub, and we're also providing a Docker file as well. Now, in the remaining few minutes, I'd like to talk about a project that we're working on with eliminating the Druggable Genome Project. Uh, the goal uh, of the IDG project is to catalyze research to improve our understanding of the properties and functions of the understudied proteins within commonly drug-targeted protein families. Uh, Reactome is developing a portal uh, by integrating resources from the IDG project and other places to provide a pathway-centric view uh, for understudied uh, human proteins. Now, before I show you our progress today, I'd like to introduce you to the IDG classification scheme called the target development levels. There's four groups. Uh, TCLIN uh, represents uh, protein targets that have at least one drug, uh, one approved drug. Uh, TCAM uh, represents targets with at least one chemical compound. TBIO represents uh, targets that do not have known drug or small molecule, excuse me, small molecule activities but do have some publications and data available. And then TDARC are essentially the understudy proteins. These are targets where virtually nothing is known. So then this screenshot, uh, we're showing the pathway browser view, uh, and in particular, a diagram for the G-alpha signaling pathway, and how that pathway looks after overlaying IDG target development levels. I'll just take a moment uh, to explain the different colors of the four levels. 
Dark blue represents uh, the T clin level. There's light blue for T chem, uh, orange for T bio, and uh, red for T dark. And as, you, as a user zooms into the diagram to view the olfactory receptor entity in this pathway, we can now see where these T dark proteins are located. Now, traditionally in the past, we would have had to have performed some form of pathway enrichment analysis with that protein list to overlay this kind of data onto the diagram. Now, the portal also supports uh, the overlay of protein and mRNA expression data collected in the IDG project. Uh, the screenshot uh, shows two human protein map protein expression data sets for adult uh, heart on the left and adult liver on the right, overlaid onto a pathway called ion channel transport. Now, the focus is on one reaction in, the, in this screenshot. Um, and on average, the proteins involved in this reaction uh, has higher expression in the heart than in the liver. And we can uh, also provide users with the opportunity to toggle to a simplified functional interaction view, uh, which shows clearly that RYR2 and 3 and several so other proteins um, have higher expression in the heart than in the liver. Um, we've also implemented features to show uh, pairwise protein interactions together with target development level information. Uh, in the viewport on the left, we can also see the drugs that are known to interact with the members of the IR the RYR tetramer complex. And in a table, uh, we get to see that list of drug interactions and, the, and some additional metadata about uh, the activity data for that particular drug and its target. So here's a summary of my talk. Uh, Reactome is a highly reliable curated database of biological pathways. Um, through our website, we provide tools and data sets for visualizing and analyzing um, pathway and experimental data. All of our data and software is open to the public. Uh, the Reactive GSA uh, tool uh, greatly reduces the technical barriers for multi-omics uh, comparative pathway analysis. Uh, likewise, the Reactive FI uh, Cytoscape app provides a powerful way to visualize and analyze uh, cancer and disease data sets. And through the IDG portal, we hope to provide a pathway-centric view for the understudied proteins. Um, I'd just like to take a moment here to acknowledge the valuable contributions of the Reactome Consortium members and the support for the uh, funding agencies. Thank you for my talk and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Robin. Uh, there are multiple questions, so I will read some of them. Are isoforms addressed in Reactome pathways? They are indeed, yes, we do. Okay, it was short. <laughs> uh, do you know if reactome offers reaction information at tissue or cell line level? Um, or you know type level, this was the question. So we tend to, uh, reactome curation tries to be kind of tissue agnostic, but through some of our analysis tools, we can incorporate uh, tissue expression data. Uh, and we do have visualization tools available through our website to look at um, both protein and expression levels of genes and pro uh, in the context of tissues, different tissues, I should say. Uh, so one last question um, regarding the ortologies. Uh, after uh, genetic duplication events, often the ortologies uh, will get different function as a mechanism of specialization, for example. How have you handled this problem, if at all? It's a difficult one. <laughs> that is a tricky one to answer. I actually feel like I should really confer with my colleagues to kind of to give an accurate answer there. Um, I don't have an answer on that, actually. I, I have to say I'm usually good at answering most questions. Um, that one I would have to follow up with. OK. Thank so you. thank you very much. I'll let you to type your answers. Uh, also, after the end of this um, um, workshop, we can continue chatting. Uh, there is no problem. Uh, it's always open for all participants. Um, so uh, yeah, by that we have uh, two free uh, minutes remaining. Uh, so I thank everyone who joined us around the world, uh, from uh, Japan to states, and uh, we had uh, 200 um, attendees uh, today. It's uh, it's very encouraging, and I hope to see you on next Bionet Visa next year uh, in uh, a real meeting, not a virtual one. Thanks a lot. The uh, workshop is over. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you, everyone, and for Ina, for the, the organizers as well. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Ina. Thanks, Thanks Ina. everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.